Insurrection, Pandemic Book 4 Written by Christine Kersey Narrated by Andrew Tell Chapter 1 Derek It had been several days since Derek and his friends had defeated the emperors, and several weeks since the pandemic had collapsed society, but now they had a new challenge on their hands the government of the state of California. Governor Moffitt and his administration had instituted a mandatory gun buyback. In other words, a gun confiscation. Not something Derek would ever go along with. Being ex-military, he believed in liberty, had fought for it. He wasn't about to sit by and watch a rogue governor take away his constitutional rights. Over the previous few days... Derek and the rest of his group had taken time to regroup after crushing Randy and his emperors, each family settling into their RV, scavenging for more food and supplies, the constant weapons training, but now they were ready to deal with the gun confiscation issue. They had to before the problem came to them. Can I talk to you? Derek said to Jeff and Chris as they finished a weapons training session the inexperienced members of their group were getting much better with using their weapons, much to Derek's relief. They needed as many shooters as they could get. Matt and Jessica's teenagers, Dylan, Kayla, and Brooke, were working especially hard, like they really got the critical nature of the training, like they really understood how important it was to be able to aim and shoot, and hit their target, even when there was a distraction. What's up? Jeff asked. Derek waited until no one was close enough to overhear. It wasn't that he wanted to keep his plans a secret, but before he told everyone else what he had in mind, he wanted to get feedback from Jeff and Chris, the other ex-military members of their group. He would have involved Matt as well, but he was still laid up after getting shot in the leg by an emperor. Been mulling over the problem with the government, Derek started. Jeff frowned. Every time I think about them taking away our weapons, it makes me... His voice trailed off as he grimaced and shook his head before spitting in the dirt. Right there with you, Derek said, before flattening his lips in disgust at the idea of random people who were most certainly protected by bodyguards wanting to take away a crucial source of self-defense from law-abiding citizens. What are we going to do about it? Chris asked. First, Derek began, we need to scope out the location mentioned on the flyer. See how many men they have. If they're armed, you know they are, Jeff said. Derek nodded. I'd be surprised if they weren't. He understood Jeff's fury, especially when he recalled entering California through the inspection station and having his own gun confiscated. He and his group had known what to expect, thanks to a man at the gas station in Reno, Nevada. So they'd come through in groups, separately, about ten minutes apart. When Derek thought about what had happened to Matt, how he'd been yanked out of his truck and slammed against the hood, which had broken his nose, all because he'd refused to hand over his guns, Derek felt his own temper rise. At least Jeff had gotten there in time to end the situation, shooting two of the men and tying up the third. I also want to see what kind of response they're getting, Derek added. See how many people are willing to give up their weapons in exchange for food and supplies. When do you want to go? Chris asked. Derek looked from Chris to Jeff. Today. An hour later, Derek and Jeff left. They decided they needed Chris at the farm for security. When the two of them were about a mile from the gun collection address, they stashed Derek's truck and went the rest of the way on foot. They'd brought a few guns to sell to the government, ones they'd taken off the emperors. What better way to get a close-up look at the way things were run than to pretend they were there to turn their guns in? When they were across the street from the building where the buyback was taking place, they paused to scope it out. This is the DMV, Jeff said with a chuckle. Then he rolled his eyes. Good use of government space. Makes sense, I guess. 
A flagpole stood out front, with an American flag hanging proudly. Something about seeing it at a building where the government was trampling on the rights of citizens rubbed Derek the wrong way. Sighing audibly, he turned his attention to the reason he and Jeff were there. Not much activity. No one was going in or coming out. Wonder how many people are still alive to sell their guns back. Jeff grunted and said, you could ask those census guys. He was referring to the group of men who had come to the farm, forced their way in, really, and kept the group captive while they searched the place. The men had claimed they were taking a census on behalf of the government. Smirking, Derek shook his head. Yeah, I'll be sure to do that. He glanced at Jeff. Ready? Yep. The pair crossed the deserted street and approached an open gate that led to the entrance of the DMV. Pausing before reaching the door, Derek listened. He heard male voices, then laughter. Letting the persona of Joe Citizen slide over him, he opened the door and stepped inside. Instantly, a pair of armed men strode to him and Jeff. They were wearing some sort of security uniform. As the first man neared him, Derek threw his hands up and took a step back, like he wasn't there to cause trouble. The men didn't slow down, reaching him and Jeff in seconds. Never saying a word, the men patted them down, withdrawing two guns each from Derek and Jeff. Welcome, a third man boomed as he walked toward them, a wide smile on his face. Mr. Friendly handed Derek a slip of paper with a number on it, and another slip of paper to Jeff. We'll catalog your weapons and call you up when we're ready for you. Derek glanced at the two people sitting in chairs and one person standing at the counter. Deja vu washed over him. If it wasn't for the pile of guns on one counter and a stack of food and water on another, the people could have been there to renew their driver's licenses. Rather startled by the incongruity of the whole situation, Derek nodded and walked to the row of seats in the back, far from everyone else. Jeff sat beside him. What do you think? Jeff murmured. Derek scanned the entire area. In addition to Mr. Friendly and the two armed men who had disarmed them, there were three men behind the counter, one talking to the customers and two handling the weapons. Kind of surprised so many people are willing to give up their guns, he replied to Jeff. Guess they're desperate for food. Not everyone has a group like ours to rely on. Derek nodded, more grateful than ever for his friends. He watched as the customer at the counter was handed a box filled with food and water before walking toward the door. Number 259, the man behind the counter called out. Derek shot a look at Jeff. Does that mean that over 250 people have sold back their guns? Jeff shook his head. Wouldn't surprise me. I mean, if your family's starving, hard to turn down free food. True, Derek sat quietly, observing all that was going on. Then they called his number. That's me, he murmured to Jeff. He stood, noting that he and Jeff were the only customers left. Derek strode to the counter. The man who stood on the other side looked less than thrilled to be there just like the DMV in days past. Holding back a chuckle, Derek handed the man the slip of paper with his number on it. The man narrowed his eyes at Derek. You turned in stolen weapons. Whichever one of the emperors Derek had taken the guns off of must have stolen the weapons before the collapse, and that information must have been logged in some sort of database. Wait, how did the government know, though? Did they have access to electricity and databases? If so, what other technology did they have? Chapter 2 Derek Actually, Derek said, I found them. On dead bodies, but who cared? Found them? The man narrowed his eyes. Where? Does it matter? The man glanced past Derek's shoulder. Was he giving some sort of signal to one of the other men? Look, Derek said, drawing the man's attention back to him. I may have scavenged an empty house or two. 
The man frowned like that was unacceptable, like the only place to get food and supplies was from the government. I want to do the right thing, Derek added. That's why I'm bringing the guns in. He didn't even feel the tiniest qualm of guilt at flat out lying to this guy. The man stared at him, clearly not buying his story. Uh-huh. Then he gave a chin lift to someone out of Derek's line of sight. Less than a second later, Derek was grabbed from behind and thrown to the floor. Deciding to see where this led, Derek let them subdue him, relaxing his body as his hands were roughly twisted behind his back and zip-tied together. He managed to look in Jeff's direction. One man had a gun pointed at Jeff's head, while another was zip-tying his hands as well. Curious why they were using zip-ties instead of handcuffs, Derek could only assume they needed to restrain people so often that they'd found zip ties more economical. They weren't even flex cuffs. Had they run out of those, too? These guys thought they could do whatever the hell they wanted. The tyranny that was happening here was beyond the pale, which only emphasized why it was critical that citizens were able to keep their weapons. Despite that, Derek had to focus on what was happening in that moment, and the fact that he and Jeff were now at the mercy of these men. Get up, a man growled at Derek, grabbing him by his upper arm and hoisting him to his feet. What did I do wrong? Derek asked. His tone was conciliatory, but inside he was itching to take these guys out. Mr. Friendly gave a signal with his head, and a moment later Jeff was brought to stand beside Derek. Mr. Friendly who no longer seemed so friendly, glared at them. Then he held his fingers up like he was about to tick off a list. Stolen weapons, breaking and entering, theft. He made a face like he smelled something sour. Who knows what else you've done? Derek resisted the urge to defend himself. What would be the point when these men were obviously loving their newfound power? We didn't mean to do anything wrong, Jeff said taking a cue from Derek. We're really sorry. You can have the guns. Chagrin washed across his face. We don't expect any food in return. Mr. Friendly threw his head back and laughed like this was the best joke he'd heard all day. Then he sobered, his now unamused gaze going between Jeff and Derek. Damn right you're not getting any food. He paused a beat. I don't know why I'm bothering to ask, but... Do you have any other firearms? Derek glanced at Jeff, whose lips twitched like he was trying to suppress a laugh. Derek swung his gaze back to Mr. Friendly. Nope. At least not on him. Mr. Friendly stared at him a moment. Uh-huh. He paused a beat before narrowing his eyes. You do understand that this gun buyback is mandatory. Yeah. Do you have any ID? Derek shook his head. Sorry, lost it somewhere. Of course you did. Mr. Friendly sighed like this wasn't something he'd wanted to have to deal with that day. What are your names? Not about to reveal anything that could identify them, Derek suppressed a smile. Joe. Jeff grinned. John. Mr. Friendly narrowed his eyes. Last names? This time, Derek couldn't hold back his smirk. Citizen, Mr. Friendly scowled deeply, then looked at Jeff. Jeff grinned. Doe, John Doe, Mr. Friendly's nostrils flared. Add lying about your identity to your list of crimes. What are your addresses? Tilting his head, Derek said, Again, sorry, we're kind of between homes right now. No way he would give them even a hint of where to find them. Mr. Friendly gazed at Derek for several long moments, like he was sizing him up and finding him wanting. You are really trying my patience, Joe Citizen. His emphasis on Derek's alias wasn't lost on Derek. Derek couldn't give a damn. The whole situation with the government's overreach was beyond the pale. Yeah, well... You and Governor Moffat are trying my patience with thinking you can do whatever the hell you want. Was he going too far? 
He glanced at Jeff, who looked just as angry as Derek felt. Derek frowned. What are you going to do with us? Mr. Friendly chewed on his bottom lip, like he was coming to a decision. Tell you what, I have a nice little home I'm going to put you in. He grinned. You won't like it, but that's too bad. Derek frowned. Taking them to who knew where wasn't something he'd bargained for. These guys could easily throw them in a jail cell and conveniently lose the key. Maybe he could talk his way out of it, but with the look of serious annoyance on Mr. Friendly's face, Derek had his doubts. Why would you want two additional mouths to feed when instead you can keep the four guns we brought and let us go on our way? We could just shoot them, the muscular man standing beside Derek said. Mr. Friendly laughed. That would solve the problem, wouldn't it? Only if you want to die too, Derek immediately replied, his voice soft and calm. Mr. Friendly got right in Derek's face. You threatening me? Derek smiled. Course not, but I can't control what our people will do in retaliation. Mr. Friendly seemed to hesitate. Besides, Derek added, aren't you a law enforcement officer? He frowned. Is that what you do nowadays? Take people out back and shoot them? Mr. Friendly huffed a sigh and shook his head. Then he decked Derek in the face. Guess he didn't like being called out, Derek thought, as blood flowed out of his nose and over his lips. Take him away, Mr. Friendly muttered. That didn't sound good. The man holding on to Derek, muscles, gripped Derek's upper arm, while a tall man took hold of Jeff before marching them out of the building and toward a panel van. When they reached the rear of the van, Derek shifted his eyes to Jeff, who lifted his eyebrows as if to ask, We gonna do this? Derek tilted his head. Wait. Derek didn't resist as the men loaded him and Jeff into the back of the van, climbing in willingly and easily like they were going to cooperate. He and Jeff sat across from each other on benches that lined the sides. The doors closed and locked behind them. Let's see where they take us, Derek murmured. See if we can gather some intel. Right, Jeff muttered. Moments later, Muscles and Tall Man climbed into the driver's and passenger's seats. Metal mesh separated the rear of the van from the front. The van backed out of the parking space and pulled onto the road. There was no traffic. They'd been driving for about 15 minutes when the van came to a stop. Derek looked at Jeff, who looked back at him. The two men got out of the front of the van, and a moment later, the rear doors swung open. From where Derek sat, all he could see were trees. It looked like an orchard. What's going on? He asked. Muscles sneered. Get out. Chapter 3 Derek Derek shifted his eyes to Jeff, who stared back. They both knew what was going on. These men had obviously been instructed to drive Derek and Jeff to the middle of nowhere and kill them. Why, though? Was this the government's solution? If anyone gave a hint of trouble, they were to be dispatched without trial? Justice had gone off the rails. That didn't surprise Derek, though. Not in this crazy world where law and order no longer existed. With his hands still bound behind his back with zip ties, Derek stood, although with the low ceiling he had to crouch. Jeff did the same. They slowly made their way to the open door. Hurry up, tall man said, his face showing how annoyed he was that he had to deal with them. Derek was annoyed too. He hadn't planned on being taken captive and assassinated. Derek reached the doorway and hopped onto the pavement, Jeff joined him a moment later. Looking around and seeing nothing but trees and no other people, Derek asked, Why did we stop? He knew the answer, but he was trying to buy time. He kept his tone conversational. No reason to tip these guys off to what he really had in mind. Muscles smirked. Thought we'd go for a walk. 
Okay, so muscles relished killing. Good to know. Derek lifted his arms behind his back. Can you take these off? Both men laughed, their faces scrunching up with amusement. Then they shook their heads like they couldn't believe Derek had asked such a ridiculous question. Tall man sobered and motioned toward the orchard with his handgun. Start walking. This was starting to go too far. If he and Jeff headed into the orchard where no one could possibly see what was going on, it would be over for them. No can do, Derek said, his voice firm. Muscle's eyebrows yanked together. What? We have no reason to walk into that orchard. Muscles pointed his gun at Derek. Here's a reason. The sound of voices filtered into the air, including a crying baby. All four men turned to see where it was coming from. A quarter mile down the road, a group of people, looked like at least a dozen, was approaching. Derek saw a stroller, as well as two shopping carts, filled with who knew what. Didn't matter. This was his chance to turn the tables. Get moving, Muscles growled. Derek couldn't hold back the smile that lifted one side of his lips. No. Using two hands, Muscles leveled his gun at Derek. You really going to shoot us in front of all of those people? Derek chin-pointed at the men's clothing. Uniforms say you're from the government. That the impression you want people to have about their government? That they'll take their guns and then shoot them? Derek's eyebrows rose. Not gonna get a lot of people so willing to turn over their weapons then, huh? This seemed to give Muscles pause. Maybe Mr. Friendly had told them to be subtle when they murdered innocent citizens. Muscles looked at Tall Man, who frowned deeply. The people were drawing closer. They eyed Muscles, Tall Man, Derek, and Jeff. Muscles and Tall Man stared right back. This was the opportunity Derek had been waiting for. With their captors distracted, Derek lifted his arms behind himself, then slammed his forearms against his hips. It hurt like a mother to have the zip ties cut into his wrists, but after three swift hits, the zip ties snapped apart. Derek looked to Jeff and saw he'd managed to break his as well. Derek kept his arms behind his back as if they were still bound, and when Muscles glanced at him, Derek avoided his gaze, focusing instead on the passing group, who were giving them a wide berth. Derek made eye contact with Jeff, then he dipped his chin in a tiny nod. Let's do this. As one, Derek and Jeff attacked their captors. Derek plowed into Muscles, knocking him to the ground and sending his gun flying. Muscles fought back, but Derek pummeled him. Muscles continued to struggle until Derek wrapped his hands around Muscles' throat, choking him until he passed out. He continued squeezing until he was sure Muscles was dead. A gunshot rang out. Startled, Derek shifted his gaze to Jeff and Tall Man. Tall Man lay on the ground, blood pooling around his head as Jeff straightened. Jeff grinned and held up the weapon. Got his gun. Nice. As Derek got to his feet, he looked toward the group of people who were now 30 yards beyond them. The group was staring at them, but the moment Derek made eye contact, they turned and hurried away. No one wanted to get involved in someone else's troubles. Jeff stood beside Derek. Now what? He grinned. Now we toss them in the orchard and take their van. Jeff nodded. Works for me. After tucking Muscle's gun into his own waistband, Derek worked with Jeff to drag the men deep into the orchard leaving their bodies to the elements. When they got back to the van, Jeff offered to drive. Derek agreed, riding shotgun and keeping an eye out for trouble as they drove to where they'd left his truck near the DMV. They exchanged the van for Derek's truck, keeping the keys to the van so that it couldn't be easily used, then headed back to the Miller's farm. When they arrived, Jeff's girlfriend, Emily, unlocked and opened the gate, while Chris backed the box truck out of the way to allow Derek to drive onto the property. 
Once the gate was locked and the box truck parked back in its place, Emily and Chris trotted over to Jeff and Derek. Emily hugged Jeff, clearly relieved to see him safely home. Derek found himself envying their relationship. He was all alone in the world, except for this group of friends he now considered family. Still, it wasn't the same as having someone to love and build a life with. An image of Paisley leapt into his mind. He was attracted to her, no question, but it was hard to imagine building any kind of new relationship in this world, not with daily survival the top priority. Shaking off his thoughts, he filled Chris and Emily in on what had happened. As Derek talked about their near brush with getting killed, Emily laid her head on Jeff's shoulder. We need to tell the others, Chris said. Derek agreed. He led the way into the house. Chapter 4 Matt Matt was feeling a lot better. It had been nearly a week since he'd been shot in the leg, but with Sarah Miller's nursing background, he'd been well taken care of. And with the antibiotics they'd acquired on their trip from Utah to California, infection was less of a concern. Sitting in the living room, he heard Derek's truck arrive. He was eager to hear what had happened on their little field trip. He hated that he hadn't been in the right shape to go along, but he knew he was of better use to their group healthy, so he suppressed his impatience. A short while later, Derek and Jeff walked into the living room. Hey, Matt, Derek said with a grin. How's the leg? Matt lifted his bandaged leg up and down. Still working, he laughed. Just a little slower. Chuckling, Derek clapped him on the back. Nice. People started trickling into the room. Everyone wanted to hear what had happened. Jessica came in and sat beside Matt. He took her hand in his, warmed by her very presence. They'd been through hell over the last month, yet they were closer than ever. A few moments later, Kayla and Brooke, both 16, came in. Matt smiled at them, his biological daughter, and his daughter by circumstance. He loved them both tremendously. And then Dylan, his 14-year-old son, walked in and sat on the floor. He'd become a man in the last month. Matt's chest burned with pride and love for his family. When he thought back to their harrowing trip across Nevada to reach California, particularly their confrontation with the emperors, a sense of relief surged through him. They'd survived so far, and with their amazing group, he was as confident as anyone in the apocalypse could be that they would continue to not only survive, but thrive. How did it go? Frank Miller asked. He was Emily's uncle, and this farm was his. And although he'd at first made it clear that he was reticent about having their large group move on to his property, he'd since expressed his appreciation for all the help that they'd given him. Matt continued to be grateful for his hospitality. Not good, Derek said with a sideways glance at Jeff. Nearly got killed. Killed? Matt sat up straighter. By who? Derek turned to him with a grim smile. By our own government. Or maybe they were hired thugs. What happened? Jessica asked, her hand squeezing Matt's like it was he who had faced possible death. In her defense, she had seen him get shot, so it wasn't like her fear was misplaced. Derek and Jeff took turns telling their tale. Jeff ended with, They underestimated us. He smiled grimly. Which is why they're dead. What are we going to do now? Paisley asked. Derek turned to her. Matt didn't know if it was his imagination, but Derek's eyes seemed to light up when he looked at Paisley. Interesting, he smiled to himself. Derek could use a little light in his life. Right now, Derek said, I suggest we do nothing. When no one spoke, he went on. We're talking about the government of the state of California. We have no idea how many people are involved. Likely, an army. He looked at each one of them. Even with Walter and his small group, 
we don't have nearly enough people to do anything about this. He shook his head. It's not like we can get on social media and rally support. It's all by word of mouth or face to face now. Matt listened silently. Things were going from bad to worse. First, they'd had to deal with the emperors. Now, the state government? Derek's gaze swept over the assembled group. Does anyone disagree that we should let things lie? At least for now? Heads shook all around. Good. Matt knew he wasn't in any shape to go up against the government. Besides, Governor Moffat and his cronies surely had better things to do than come after Matt and the rest of his group. At least he hoped so. Okay, Derek said with a smile. We're in agreement. Then he grimaced. When we're out scavenging, we need to be on high alert. If we want to stay under the government's radar, we need to stay far away from anyone working for them. Matt felt Jessica shift in her seat beside him. He looked at her. She was looking at Derek. What about those guys that came by? She asked. The ones who said they were taking a census? Derek frowned. Yeah, that's been on my mind too. Matt remembered that day, not too long ago, when he and Derek and Dylan had come back from a scavenging run to find a pair of vehicles parked at the farm. He and Derek and Dylan had surveilled the house and had seen four unknown men. When the men had left, Matt, Derek, and Dylan had come inside, and Jessica and Jeff had filled them in. The men had claimed they were taking a census for the government, but apparently they'd held a gun to Sarah's head to force everyone to disarm. Then they'd poked around the farm like they had free reign. It was extremely worrisome. We need to review our defensive positions, Jeff said, his tone low and sure. In case they come back, he frowned. If they do, we take them out. No questions asked. Heads nodded all around, including Matt's. Those men had no right to be there and make themselves at home. If they came back, they would have to force their way onto the property because there was no way Matt and the others would allow them to approach willingly. Chapter 5. Derek We can create a sniper's nest up there, Jeff said the next morning, as he pointed to a window in the barn that overlooked the driveway. Derek nodded. Good idea. He was thrilled he had Jeff to give input. The man had proven to be worth his weight in gold. Everyone in the group was doing their part. We'll increase the number of people on patrol to three, as well as up our training. Jeff nodded. What about booby traps? Tilting his head, Derek smiled. Definitely. He thought about the kids in their group. We'll have to keep a closer eye on the little ones. Chris and Amy keep their kids pretty close to the house, and Paisley's little girl is usually right with those boys. At the mention of Paisley, Derek felt his face heat. To cover it, he coughed and turned away to look at the fence line. You think those government guys will come back? Jeff asked, drawing Derek's attention. Though Derek dearly hoped they wouldn't, he knew hopes got you nowhere, not in the world they were living in. He shrugged. Don't know, but we have to assume they will. Jeff's lips curled with loathing. I'll be first in line to take them down. Derek's eyebrows rose. Then he smirked. I know you will. Over the next few days, the group stayed close to home, focusing on implementing their new security measures, including building a number of booby traps. Derek made sure everyone knew exactly where the booby traps were located. They didn't need anyone getting hurt or killed by their own traps. They also set up the sniper's nest and took turns manning that. Using the solar in Matt and Jessica's RV to charge the walkies has been huge, Chris said over breakfast one morning. But it would be prudent to have additional power sources for backup. Jeff, Emily, and Dylan were on security detail, but the others were all listening intently. They all had a stake in keeping the farm secure. 
Derek nodded. They relied on the walkies to communicate. If they had no way to charge them, it could mean the difference between life and death. What about taking panels from the houses? Jessica asked as she poured water from a pitcher into her glass. I'm sure tons of people have panels on their roofs. We can take some and use them here. Derek grinned. Excellent idea. He looked at Matt, whose legs seemed to be improving. What else would we need to create electricity? What does your RV use? Batteries and an inverter. Okay, Derek said with a nod. I'm going on a supply run today. Let's make those items a priority. I'd like to go on the run, Jessica said. Derek turned to her in surprise. She'd never expressed a desire to go on a run before, had barely left the farm, in fact. Still, the more people who could help, the better. Guess she was gaining confidence. That was a good thing. He smiled. Absolutely. Then it occurred to him that Matt may not be as thrilled. Derek looked at Matt, who was frowning deeply in Jessica's direction, although she seemed to be studiously ignoring him. Holding back a chuckle, Derek scooped up a fork full of eggs. This was something Jessica and Matt would have to work out. Everyone had to pull their own weight, and everyone, even the women and teenagers, had to take risks. It was the only way they would all survive. Does anyone want more eggs? Sarah asked, evidently trying to ease the sudden tension. I'll take some, my dear, Frank said with a warm smile at his wife. Derek amended the thought that everyone had to take risks. They needed Sarah safe and sound on the farm, not only for her nursing skills, but she made a mean scrambled egg as well. He grinned at the thought. Do you think the chickens can keep up with how many eggs we eat? Brooke asked. Sarah smiled at her. I hope so, because people are hungry. She winked at her husband, who smiled back. Is it possible? Paisley began. Then she stopped and cleared her throat. Derek knew what that meant. There was something she wanted, but she didn't like asking for things. She seemed to prefer to get what she needed on her own. He liked that, but he also knew there were times she would have to ask for what she needed. And the things she asked for were typically things that she truly needed. He smiled at her, but she wasn't looking at him. Paisley, she shifted her eyes to his, sending an unexpected jolt to his heart. Ignoring his growing attraction, he said, what were you going to ask? She kept her gaze steady on his, something he appreciated. Though she was clearly uncomfortable asking for anything, once called out, she faced it head on. I was wondering if, you know, if you do get some solar panels, would it be possible to get extra so I can hook them up to the batteries in my RV? I'd like to be able to use the lights in there instead of candles. I worry that I might accidentally start a fire. Such a simple request, one he should have thought of himself. Glad that at least she'd brought it up. Derek smiled, one side of his mouth tilting up. That's a great idea. He tore his gaze from her, sweeping it across the group. Each RV should have a panel to hook up to its batteries. He glanced back at Paisley as he spoke, noticing that she seemed pleased that he liked her idea. A fire would be catastrophic. Now he turned to Frank and Sarah. Let's get some panels for the house as well. I'm not sure how we'd wire it up, but if you could avoid using candles too, that would be ideal. Frank nodded. That would be great. Can we add dog food to the list for the run? Brooke asked, glancing toward Cleo, her German shepherd, who was stretched out on the deck in the sunshine just outside the kitchen. She looked to Derek for confirmation. He nodded. Yep. Then he shifted his gaze to Sarah. Can you put a list together after breakfast? She smiled. I already have one. Chapter 6 Jessica I'll be fine, Jessica said to Matt with a shake of her head. The moment breakfast had finished and they'd gone to their RV, He'd tried to convince her not to go on that day's supply run, or 
any run, for that matter. You don't know that. Limping a bit, he paced the short distance from one end of their tiny living room to the other. You haven't been out there. You don't know what it's like. As true as that was, she had every intention of getting out there. It wasn't fair for her to stay in the relative safety of the farm while others went out and found food and other supplies that she benefited from. Besides, she felt ready to face whatever danger was out there. She'd been training hard on using guns and other weapons, as well as learning where vulnerable parts of the body were, like where the carotid artery was located, something she'd had an idea of but had never considered stabbing. In addition, when they'd fought the emperors, she'd killed a man. It had been horrendous, but she believed that when push came to shove, she could handle herself. Matt stopped and faced her as she sat on the couch. I'm not going to change your mind, am I? Knowing how much it pained him to admit that, she slowly shook her head. He sighed audibly. Fine, go. But I'm going to. She couldn't stop her gaze from going to his wounded leg. But you're not ready. This time, he grinned. I'll be fine. Hating the way he threw her words back in her face, she pursed her lips, but didn't argue. Okay, we'll both go. His face lit up with triumph. I'll let Derek know. At that, he left the RV, but he was back a few minutes later, storm clouds in his eyes. What's wrong? Jaw clenching, he shook his head. Derek said he didn't want me to come. Said he needed people who could climb onto roofs and get panels down. Said I would be better utilized here. Jessica could see how upset this made Matt, but she couldn't disagree with Derek's logic. With Matt's leg still healing, he wasn't in the right shape to climb onto a roof. I'm sorry, Matt. He shook his head, frustration clear in his face. But after several quiet moments, the emotion began to clear. That was one thing Jessica had always loved about him. He didn't hold on to being upset for long. I respect Derek, Matt said as he stared at the floor. Then he sighed deeply. And I can see his point. He lifted his gaze to Jessica. Stay here with me. Tempted to acquiesce, if only to make Matt happy, Jessica stared at him, but didn't say anything. He had to accept that he couldn't always protect her, and she needed to prove to herself that she could stand on her own. As much as she loved and adored her husband, the reality was in this new world, there was no guarantee that anyone would live from one day to the next. She had to learn how to take care of herself. His eyes bored into hers, but... When she stayed silent, he clenched his jaw and turned away. You ready for this? Derek asked Jessica as they got ready to roll. It would be her, Derek, and Chris. She glanced at Matt, who, despite his reticence, had come to see her off. She'll be awesome, Matt said with a confident tone. Then he turned to her with an encouraging smile. Jessica hadn't expected him to support her like this, which almost made her want to say she'd changed her mind and that she would stay with him. Almost. Instead, she stepped close to him and kissed him on the lips. Thank you, sweetheart. That means a lot to me. He gently stroked her face. Be careful out there. His eyes went to Derek and Chris before meeting her gaze. You're in good hands. She nodded. I need to do this. Matt smiled softly. I know. Grateful to be married to such an amazing man, Jessica embraced him. I love you. I love you, he murmured in her ear. She drew away. I'll see you in a couple of hours. He nodded, but didn't reply. As they drove away in Derek's truck, she turned and looked at Matt, who was watching intently as they headed toward the gate. She was sitting in the back seat while Derek drove and Chris took shotgun. Jeff stood by the open gate, ready to close and lock it behind them once they went through. 
The moment they turned onto the paved road that ran in front of the farm's driveway, Jessica felt a surge of excitement and fear. The last time she'd been away from the farm had been the day they'd fought the emperors. That had been terrifying. But they'd had a plan, and it had worked. They had rescued Walter's grandchildren and had eliminated the emperors, including their leader, Randy. Now, though, she had no idea what to expect. But she hoped they wouldn't have any dangerous interactions with other pandemic survivors. I remember seeing a house not too far from here with panels on the roof, Derek said as he drove. We also need an inverter, Chris added. Derek turned and looked at him. We can take one from a solar-powered house. Chris chuckled. Didn't think of that. Soon, they pulled into the driveway of a house. Jessica's eyes went to the roof, where she saw two perfectly laid out rows of solar panels. Bingo. Eager to help, she hopped out of the truck the moment the engine turned off. What do you want me to do? She asked Derek. He stood beside the truck as he surveyed the area. When he was apparently satisfied that no one was lurking about, he turned to her with a grim expression. First, we need to clear the place. Then Chris will get on the roof while you and I keep watch. Sounded easy enough. Feeling more confident by the minute, Jessica smiled broadly. Works for me. He nodded, then led the way to the front door, his gun in the low ready position. Motioning for Jessica to stand to one side of the door, he stood on the other while Chris turned the knob and shoved the door open. As the door swung wide, Chris held his gun in one hand while supporting his wrist with the other. He swept the entrance, then briskly nodded before stepping over the threshold. Derek followed him in with Jessica on his heels. As she entered, she did a few slow blinks to help her eyes adjust to the dim interior. Relying on her recent training, when Chris headed down a hallway and Derek headed up the stairs, she moved toward the kitchen. Nervous, yet exhilarated to be on her own, she listened intently for any noises that were out of place as her gaze probed every corner she could see. With her gun leading, she rounded the kitchen island, her heart racing. What if someone was hiding there? But no one was. She checked the walk-in pantry and a nearby laundry room. All clear. The garage door stood in front of her, prepared to open it and begin a search. When Derek and Chris appeared beside her, she felt herself relax. This area is clear, she said. Derek nodded. Upstairs is clear. Let's check the garage, Chris said. Derek went first this time, and within 30 seconds, they'd cleared the garage as well. Chris manually opened the garage door, flooding the space with sunlight. I'll grab our ladder and get started. Derek nodded. Looks like the inverter's over there. He turned to Jessica. You're on security detail. Knowing they were depending on her, Jessica felt a powerful sense of responsibility. This was the first time it would be all on her. Lots of firsts, but each one successfully achieved made her confidence grow. She had this. With a quick nod, she walked out of the garage and strode around the perimeter of the property, on high alert for any movement. She wished they'd brought Cleo along. Having the German Shepherd would not only give her a partner, but Cleo would be able to warn her if someone approached, and protect her if needed. Cleo had gone on a few runs, but they didn't always bring her. Jessica would talk to Derek about making Cleo a regular. She reached the front of the house and saw Chris on the roof dismantling a solar panel. Derek was still in the garage, trying to remove the inverter. As they worked, Jessica walked toward the street, her eyes sweeping the area. Movement caught her eye. About 50 yards away, two armed men were walking down the street, and they were heading in Jessica's direction. Chapter 7 Derek Someone's coming, Jessica said to Derek. She sounded out of breath, like she'd sprinted to the garage. 
He was nearly done removing the inverter, but set down the screwdriver and faced her. Where? She pointed toward the street. He looked in that direction. A grouping of trees blocked most of his view. That was good. It would make it harder for anyone to see them from the street. Except Chris was on the roof, in clear view. Derek turned to Jessica. Stay here and stay out of sight. She nodded and headed into the garage before Derek turned and trotted toward the trees that lined the property, keeping himself out of the men's view. He pressed his back against one of the trunks, then craned his neck around to watch the men as they drew closer. They were now about ten yards away. A man wearing a ball cap backwards on his head pointed toward the roof where Chris was working, his mouth moving as he talked to his companion, a man in a blue t-shirt. Both men reached for the guns at their hips, drawing their weapons, but keeping them pointed at the asphalt. Their eyes were riveted to Chris, which gave Derek the opportunity to watch them without being observed. When they began angling toward the driveway, Derek moved as well, keeping himself hidden. Glancing toward Chris, who was hunched over a solar panel, Derek knew Chris was depending on him and Jessica to watch his six as he focused on his job. The men passed Derek, completely unaware that they were being tracked. Being as stealthy as he could, Derek crept up behind the men, who stayed silent. They both appeared to be in their thirties, both on the thin side, probably assumed this was Chris's house and that he had food they could take. No matter, Derek would shut down any hopes they had of ambushing Chris. Both men began lifting their handguns, but when Derek said, Don't move, they froze, their backs to him. Derek shifted his Glock from one man to the other. Drop your weapons. His voice was low and menacing. They hesitated. I'm not going to ask again. Derek glanced at Chris, who must have heard his commands because he had turned around and gotten into a crouch. His gun pointed at the men. Then Jessica came out of the garage. Her gun pointed at the men as she strode steadily forward. Obviously outnumbered, the men dropped their guns. Kick them away. They did, and Derek collected their weapons. Face down on the ground with your hands on the backs of your heads. Please don't shoot us, the man in the blue t-shirt said. We were just looking for food. Just as Derek suspected. Look, we don't want to hurt anyone, but we're not about to take a chance on you hurting us either. So cooperate and we'll all walk away. They both got on the ground and put their hands on their heads. By then, Chris had scrambled down the ladder and joined Derek, and Jessica had reached them, her gun pointed at the men. Derek and Chris each searched a man, while Jessica covered them. Each man had a knife, which Derek and Chris pocketed before straightening. The men stayed on the ground with their hands on their heads. Derek looked at Jessica and Chris with a frown. What were they supposed to do with these guys? Derek wasn't about to kill someone who hadn't attacked them, but he couldn't just let them go. Not when they were working on getting those solar panels. We could tie them up, Jessica said, clearly understanding his dilemma. Chris nodded. Derek sighed, annoyed with this wrinkle. Agreed. He gestured with his chin to Jessica. See if you can find some rope. She nodded and jogged away. Derek looked at Chris. Back to work? Yep. Off he went. Derek didn't speak as he waited for Jessica to return, which she did a short time later with a long length of rope. While she held her gun on the men, Derek cut off shorter lengths of rope and tied the men's hands behind their backs while they were still on the ground. Can we get up? Ballcap asked. No, Derek said, with a tone that said the matter wasn't up for debate. The man swore vehemently. Not in front of the lady, Derek growled, before kicking Ballcap in the side, hard enough to send a message without doing any serious damage. Ballcap quieted, although his body had tensed, 
like he was furious. That didn't bother Derek in the slightest. Still needing to remove the inverter, but not wanting to leave Jessica alone with the men, Derek tried to figure out what to do. There was still a long section of rope he hadn't used. He got an idea. I changed my mind, he said with a smirk that only Jessica could see. Get up. What for? Ballcap asked. So you can shoot us? This guy was getting on Derek's nerves. Don't give me a reason to. Ballcap didn't reply as he struggled to get up. Blue T-shirt had silently rolled onto his side before getting his legs under him and standing. Ballcap was on his feet a few moments later. When his gaze went to Derek, his eyes widened like he recognized him. What the heck? Trying to get a read on the man, Derek narrowed his eyes as he studied his face. Ballcap gave nothing away. Something wrong? Derek asked. Ballcap smiled in a way that said he knew something Derek didn't, which annoyed Derek mightily. Nope, everything's great. Grunting, Derek stared at the man. Then he motioned with his gun toward a tree with a sturdy trunk. This way, the men did as he commanded, stopping beside the tree. Put your back against the tree, Derek said to Ballcap. Grumbling the entire time, he did as he was told. Jessica kept her gun trained on blue t-shirt while Derek tied ball cap to the tree. Your turn, Derek said to blue t-shirt. On the other side, back against the trunk. The man followed the instructions without complaint, and Derek tied him to the tree as well, wrapping the rope around ball cap a second time in the process. These men weren't going anywhere at least for the duration of time Derek and Chris needed to get the panels and inverter. With a nod at Jessica, who was watching the men closely, her gun in her hand, Derek hustled off to the garage. The tree was within view, and as he worked, he checked on the men and the surrounding area from time to time. Once the inverter was uninstalled, Derek placed it in the back of the truck. Then he helped Chris get several panels down from the roof placing them carefully in the bed of the truck and wrapping them in blankets Frank had supplied. What do you want to do with those guys? Chris asked with a chin lift at the men tied to the tree a short distance away. Derek smirked. We could leave them. Then he frowned. But that would be a death sentence. Chris nodded. Let's cut them loose. They walked over to Jessica. Her body language told Derek she was alert but relaxed. Derek was proud of how she'd handled herself on this run. They still had more to do, but his confidence in her had grown tremendously. You gonna let us go? Ballcap asked. Derek stared at the man. Only if you tell me why you reacted the way you did when you saw me. The man's forehead furrowed like he was confused. I don't know what you're talking about. Had Derek imagined it? He didn't think so but obviously Ball Cap wasn't about to tell him anything. You're sure that's the answer you want to give? Ball Cap shrugged. You looked familiar, like someone I used to know. That's all. Derek didn't believe him, but did it matter? What could the man possibly know about Derek that could make the man dangerous? Derek walked around to the other side of the trunk and looked at Blue T-shirt. Anything you want to say? The man's eyes widened like he was suddenly terrified. You gonna shoot me? Why would he jump to that conclusion? Derek tilted his head. Any reason I should? The man vigorously shook his head. No? Then I guess I won't. The man's eyes fluttered closed in apparent relief before he met Derek's gaze. Thank you. Derek pulled his knife out of its sheath. It was a hunting knife with a wicked-looking blade. The man's eyes nearly popped out of his head. To cut the rope, Derek said in a calm voice. The man exhaled, then nodded. Don't give me a reason to kill you. The man's head bobbed up and down. Course not. Derek slid the blade under the knot he'd tied, cutting through the rope. The rope loosened, but didn't fall off. It circled the trunk several times, 
and would have to be unwound. Derek cut the knot, holding ball cap to the tree. I'll leave it to you guys to get yourselves loose. Derek looked at Chris and Jessica before jerking his head toward the truck. The three of them jogged over to the truck, climbed in, and drove off. Chapter 8 Derek Next stop, a neighborhood they hadn't scavenged yet. The place looked as abandoned as every other neighborhood they'd been to. Yards had become overgrown, trash was scattered throughout the street, no people were around, some houses had red X's on the door, and some did not, and dusty cars sat in driveways and at the curb. Okay, Derek said as he hopped out of his truck and walked around the hood to face his team. Jessica, you're with me. Chris, you know what to do. With a nod, Chris trotted off. Derek turned to Jessica. Which house should we start with? The goal was for her to eventually lead a scavenge with a team of her own. They all needed to develop that skill. She studied the nearby houses, finally pointing to one without a red X on the door. That one, Derek nodded. Though houses marked with a red X were less likely to have already been scavenged, Derek preferred to go into houses that had a lower possibility of being occupied by a diseased and reeking corpse. Good. Jessica smiled, then turned and led the way to the house. Once they reached the door, she stepped to the side and let Derek take over. The door was locked, which was never the best sign. It could mean the house was occupied. Still, he didn't let that stop him. To make sure the house was empty, he knocked loud and strong. When no one answered, he peered into the front window. No people were visible. Rather than attempt to kick the door in, he went around to the side of the house where the door into the garage was located. That door was locked as well, but in his experience, the locks on those doors were nowhere near as strong as the locks on front doors. And after two swift kicks, the door burst inward. It was dark inside, so he flicked on his flashlight and scanned the space. Nothing moved. Jessica was right behind him. After clearing the garage, Derek went directly to the door that led into the house. It was unlocked. Something else he'd found was common. Before the pandemic, most people had evidently come and gone through their garages and not bothered to lock that door. That had certainly been his habit. He and Jessica went inside. Sunlight poured in through the kitchen windows. No stink of corpses filled the air. The space told the story of people trying to leave in a hurry. Two boxes, half filled with canned goods, sat on the dining room table, along with several small bottles of water. Towels and sheets were stacked on the other end of the table. Hello, Derek called out. Anyone home? No response. Wearing a grim expression, Derek nodded at Jessica. She got to work going through the cabinets, loading what she found into the boxes, while Derek went through the rest of the house. When they were done, they carried their haul out the front door and placed everything into the bed of the truck. Chris arrived a short time later with his own boxes, including a large bag of dog food. Let me see Sarah's list, Chris said. Derek handed it over. Chris skimmed it, pointing to the things he'd gotten. Then he asked, is there anything neither of us have gotten? Derek reviewed the list, then shook his head. Nope, we got lucky this time. Tucking the list in his pocket, he grinned. Let's head home. They all climbed into the truck, but when Derek turned his key, nothing happened. Not even a click. What the heck? He muttered. He hadn't had trouble with his truck in ages. He'd always made a point of keeping it in perfect working order, and it hadn't been that long since it was last serviced. He pulled the lever to release the hood, then got out and lifted it before securing it in place. Chris and Jessica joined him. Though he could do basic car maintenance, Derek was no mechanic, and as he stared at the engine, he had no clue what the problem could be. 
he turned to Chris and Jessica. Any guesses? They both shook their heads. Sighing audibly, Derek scanned the neighborhood. There were a number of vehicles within view. If they could find a set of keys, they could move their haul from his truck to another vehicle and be on their way. He left the hood open. Okay, we'll split up and look for car keys. He didn't want to send Jessica into a house they hadn't cleared yet, so he told her to search the house they'd just scavenged. He didn't remember seeing any keys in it, but keys hadn't been on their list, so he hadn't been looking for any. With any luck, she'd find a set. She nodded and jogged away. He and Chris went to separate houses, ones they hadn't been in before. Before he could search, he had to take a few minutes to clear it. Then he dug through kitchen drawers as well as bedroom dressers. Nothing. Shaking his head in annoyance, he just hoped Chris or Jessica had had better luck. He went out the front door to meet up with them, but what he saw made him gape in disbelief. His truck was no longer parked where he'd left it. Instead, it was rapidly leaving the neighborhood with all of their supplies in it. He could see what looked like a pair of men in the cab. Swearing under his breath, Derek shook his head. Obviously, someone had sabotaged their truck only to take it with the solar panels and other supplies neatly loaded. And he'd foolishly left the keys in the ignition. Supremely annoyed, Derek reminded himself that they could find more of what they needed, even if it had taken them all morning to get it. Chris came trotting out of the house he'd been searching. Derek could tell the moment Chris realized the truck was gone. Chris's mouth fell open as his eyebrows jerked together. Where's your truck? Gone. What? Derek explained what he'd seen. Chris slowly shook his head. Perfect. Derek wondered what was taking Jessica so long. He looked toward the house she'd been assigned to check, but all was quiet. A sense of foreboding washed over him, and without another word, he ran to the house she'd gone in. Jessica! Jessica! Where are you? When there was no answering reply, the annoyance he'd felt at having his truck stolen turned to panic. Whoever had taken his truck had taken more than their scavenged supplies. They'd taken Jessica. Chapter 9. Jessica. Jessica was terrified. Hands and feet bound and mouth covered with duct tape, she lay in the back seat of Derek's truck, her back against the cushion and her eyes frantically searching for a way to escape. Two men sat in the front, one driving and the other in the passenger seat. She had no idea who they were or why they'd taken her. Well, she had an idea why they'd taken her, but she didn't want to think about that. It only made her terror skyrocket into absolute panic. Trying to keep from hyperventilating, she focused on slowly breathing, in and out, in and out. The men stunk, probably hadn't bathed since before the apocalypse. Jessica nearly gagged at the stench. In the past, when she smelled something nasty, she would breathe through her mouth to avoid smelling it. Now, though, she had no choice but to breathe through her nose. Her hands were bound in front of her, but the tape covered not only her wrists, but part of her hands, too. Otherwise, she would easily be able to rip the duct tape from her mouth. The tips of her fingers weren't covered, though, so she picked at the edges of the tape on her mouth, eager to get it off. As she worked, her imagination took over, spinning tales of what was going to happen to her. The more she thought of possible scenarios, the more desperate she became to escape. She had to get away from these guys, had to save herself, had to get back to her family before these guys killed her, or worse. Desperate to think of something else, she replayed the moment the men had taken her. She'd been digging through a drawer in the kitchen, looking for car keys, when she'd felt more than heard someone approach. The hairs on the back of her neck stood on end, 
and all the training she'd done over the last few weeks flew completely out of her head as she stood frozen. Hot breath hit the back of her neck. Goosebumps rose on her arms. The blood drained from her face. Someone was behind her, someone she didn't know. She felt her gun being removed from the back of her jeans. Crap, now what? She could call for Derek. He would protect her. She opened her mouth to scream, but before any sound could come out, a large hand clamped over her lips. Eyes going wide as her heart nearly galloped out of her chest, her mind went blank with panic. Then it occurred to her that she could bite the hand covering her mouth, but try as she might, she couldn't sink her teeth into her attacker's flesh. His hand was too big. A moment later, she was lifted off of her feet. The man held her in such a way that her arms were pinned to her sides, but her legs were still free. She flailed and kicked and threw her head back until a gun was pressed to her head and a menacing voice murmured, Stop fighting or I shoot. Terrified of being murdered, she reluctantly obeyed, then tried not to sob as a pair of men bound her hands and feet with duct tape before stretching a wide piece of the tape across her mouth. Completely helpless as she was carried out of the house, all Jessica could do was hope that Derek or Chris would see what was happening and come to her rescue. But they didn't. The men tossed her into the back seat of the truck and softly closed the door. It was Derek's truck. Then Jessica remembered. The truck wouldn't start. Hope surged through her chest. She heard the men talking in low voices, but they were outside. They hadn't even tried to start the truck. Hurry, Derek, come outside, Chris, her mind screamed. She heard the sound of the truck's hood being gently closed. The men got back in the truck. They turned the key that Derek must have left in the ignition. The truck started right up. That's when Jessica knew. These men had done something to the truck to make it not start, they must have been watching her and Derek and Chris the whole time they'd been in this neighborhood. They'd planned this to take her. Jessica's blood ran cold. Now, as they drove, Jessica struggled to turn her mind away from that horrifying moment and to focus instead on what she could do to get away, because she had to escape. She had no idea where they were or where they were going. Since she and her group had arrived in California, she'd barely left the farm. She knew nothing about the area. If, no, when she escaped, how would she know where to go to find the farm? Her feeling of vulnerability and helplessness grew a thousandfold. She began to hyperventilate. Get it together, Jess. You'll figure it out. You've already been through a lot, and you've been training. Use it. Otherwise, you'll never see your family again. That last thought almost made her lose it. But she turned her eyes to the men who had taken her, hatred for them redirecting her focus. Who did they think they were? What made them think they could just take her like she was a piece of meat on a shelf? She had a family, damn it. A husband who adored her. Thoughts of Matt brought a sharp pain to her heart. When he found out she'd been kidnapped, he was going to freak. Stop it. Focus, focus, focus. How you doing back there, honey? The man in the passenger seat asked as he grinned at her. She yanked her hands away from the duct tape at her mouth, desperately wishing she had her gun and that her hands were free. She would happily shoot both of the men dead. No regrets. Instead, she glared at him and let her fury chase away her fear. Don't worry now, he said, his eyes shining. Was he stoned? We'll be there soon. Where was there? And who else would be there? Jessica pictured the moment they would open the door of the truck to take her out. 
she would kick them in the groin before making a run for it, except that would be impossible with her ankles bound. Had Derek and Chris noticed yet that she was missing? Were they even at that moment searching for her? How would they know where to look? They would have zero idea which way these men had gone. Jessica couldn't expect to be rescued by anyone. It was all on her. Chapter 10. Derek. She's gone, Derek said to Chris, who had joined him inside the house. They took her. Chris's face blanched. Oh, no. Maybe they could catch up. Did you find any keys? Chris shook his head. No. You? Grimacing, Derek shook his head. No. Had those men taken all the car keys from this neighborhood to prevent being followed? Didn't matter. He and Chris would find a way to get Jessica back. They had to. Matt's face filled Derek's mind. Matt would be devastated and furious. He'd wanted to come on this run, but Derek had shut him down. Matt would blame Derek for this, and Derek deserved all the blame. He should never have sent Jessica into that house alone. Just because they'd cleared it before didn't mean those men couldn't sneak in and grab her, which they'd obviously done. Time to stop his recriminations and create a plan. Pulling his mind into sharp focus, he scanned the neighborhood. Okay, here's what we're going to do. They couldn't have taken every key from every house. He sighed heavily. I don't want to waste time looking for a damn pair of car keys, but we can't cover much ground on foot. Not when they're in a truck. He clenched his jaw. My truck. He shook his head. He didn't give a damn about losing his truck, not in comparison to Jessica being taken. It was simply the audacity of these guys. Doing something to his truck to put him and Chris in a position of weakness while they took Jessica. Let's go one street over, Chris said, his voice calm, which helped to calm Derek. I'm sure we can find a car with keys nearby. Good idea. They took off at a run, going through the backyard of the nearest house and climbing over the fence. Once in the backyard neighbor's property, they headed directly to the house, smashing a window to get in when they found the sliding glass door locked. Derek didn't even care if someone was home. He had a mission, and he wouldn't let anyone slow him down. No one reacted to their brazen action, so he and Chris quickly ransacked the house. And after a few minutes, Chris shouted, Got it! Derek looked over to see Chris holding up a set of shiny keys. Relief, powerful and swift, burned through him. Now they would at least have a way to try to find Jessica. He and Chris tore through the house and to the garage. Chris manually opened the garage door. Sunlight streamed in. A blacked-out Dodge Charger sat right in the middle of the tidy garage. Derek had always admired the beefy-looking vehicles, and if the situation weren't so dire, he would have taken a moment to enjoy this opportunity. Instead, he jumped into the driver's seat while Chris hopped into the passenger side. A moment later, they were driving down the street in the same direction he'd seen Jessica's captors go. When they reached the end of the street, he turned left, as the men they were trying to find had done, but when they reached the next corner, he had no idea which way to go. He hadn't been able to see that far. Crap! He looked one way and then the other, wishing mightily for some way to know which direction to take. The farm is that way, Chris said, pointing to the right. So, maybe go the opposite? The logic was as good as anything he could come up with, so Derek turned left. He drove slow enough for them to take a long look down all the streets they passed, but fast enough to keep things moving. Half a mile down the road, a man was slowly walking along the sidewalk. Derek pulled up alongside him. The man looked their way, quickly backing up, his eyes wide with fear. He was on Chris's side of the car, so Chris called out to him through his open window. Did you see a truck go by here in the last ten minutes? 
The man stared at them like he was afraid of what they really wanted. We're just looking for our friend, Chris said, his tone reassuring. After another moment of hesitation, one in which Derek wanted to get out and throttle the man for taking so long to answer, the man finally nodded. Yeah, I seen a truck drive by a little while ago. Stark relief that they were on the right track swept over Derek. He leaned across the console and called out, Did you see them turn anywhere? The man's eyes shifted to Derek. After a moment, he shook his head. They went straight. He pointed down the road in the direction they were already headed. Thanks, Chris shouted to the man as Derek hit the gas. They drove forward, their eyes scanning, scanning. No truck, no Jessica. They'd driven nearly two miles when they came to a crossroads. They had to turn either left or right. They couldn't go straight. They hadn't passed any other people they could ask. Derek looked at Chris, who shook his head and said, No idea, bro. After a momentary pause, Derek said, All right, we'll search to the left, and then we'll turn around and search the other way. Chris nodded. Yep. Over the next hour, they drove up and down every street in the area, gradually expanding outward. We need more searchers, Derek said, after they'd completed searching in yet another neighborhood. I agree. Create search grids. Derek nodded. Let's head back to the farm. He dreaded facing Matt, but it wasn't right to keep this horrifying news from him a moment longer. Chapter 11. Jessica. The truck lurched to a stop. The men got out. Jessica's heart began to pound. They'd arrived at whatever place they'd been headed. What would happen now? She braced herself to deal with whatever was coming next. Stretched out on the back seat, she couldn't see anything. Were they in a neighborhood? Out in the middle of nowhere? The rear door opened. One of the men stood there and stared at her. Creeped out, Jessica stared back. This was the guy who'd been in the passenger seat. His jeans and T-shirt were smeared with dirt. His hair was shaggy and greasy. Shaggy slowly smiled, then reached for Jessica's legs. She drew them toward her and out of his reach. Shaggy frowned, but he was forced to bend forward and lean inside the truck to reach her. She waited until his head was fully inside the truck. That's when she struck. Her ankles were bound together, but she used that to her advantage, aiming for his chin as she smashed both feet into his face. Her precision worked. His head slammed upward into the metal frame of the truck. He cried out, then blood poured from his mouth. Must have bit his tongue. Jessica would have grinned, but the duct tape kept her lips from moving. He jerked backwards out of the truck, his hands pressed to his face as blood leaked through his fingers. He swore violently, then he leaned forward like he was going to come after her. Jessica's heart hammered against her ribs. This guy could kill her, but she didn't regret kicking him. Back off, Bo, the man who had been driving said to Shaggy. Bo turned to his partner. She kicked me, man. He took his hands away from his face to show his partner the blood. Jessica couldn't see the second man's face, but she was grateful he'd stopped his buddy from retaliating against her. Don't care, bro, the second man said. The boss wants her undamaged. Jessica's stomach dropped. Who was this boss, and what did he have planned? Fresh dread surged through her. He ain't even here, Bo said. So she had a little time before her fate was sealed. That was one thing to be grateful for. Neither of her captors were looking her way, so she went back to picking at the edge of the duct tape. Earlier, she'd managed to lift a corner. Now she scraped at it, trying to peel it off of her mouth. It would be so much easier if one of her thumbs was free. She was scratching her own face, but... She didn't care. Desperate to get the tape off of her mouth, she scraped harder. 
but only managed to remove about an inch of the tape. Shaggy, she preferred the name she'd given him to his real name, turned back to her. She dropped her hands to her stomach. I'll get you back eventually, he said with a nasty grin. Not allowing her imagination to take flight on what that would look like, Jessica shifted her eyes away from his face. She didn't want to give him the satisfaction of knowing that inside, she was quaking. Move aside, the other man said to Shaggy. Shaggy did as he was told. Clearly, this man was the one in charge, at least until their boss returned. When he came into view, Jessica met his gaze, searching for any sign of compassion, but his dead eyes reminded her of Randy. This guy obviously saw her as an object, like she wasn't even human. Fresh fear crashed over her. Don't do anything stupid, he said, or I'll let Bo do whatever he wants with you. That was enough of a threat to keep her from lashing out with her feet, what she wouldn't give to have her gun in her hands. As he reached for her, she saw a wolf tattooed on the side of his right arm. Deciding to cooperate, maybe if she pretended to be submissive, she could strike when they least expected it. She let Wolf grab her legs and pull her out of the truck. His touch made her skin crawl, but what could she do? When her feet touched the dirt, she took a moment to get her bearings. Other houses were around, but they were spread out with at least 50 feet between them. Was anyone in those houses? She doubted it. Even if they were, she couldn't scream, not with the duct tape over her lips. I'm gonna free your legs, Wolf said as he stared at her, his eyes hard as coal. Don't do something to make me regret it, he narrowed his eyes. I will kill you if you try to run. Jessica's heart felt like it had stopped beating. She had no doubt he meant it. She nodded her agreement to cooperate, at least until she had a more certain chance of escaping. Wolf stared at her a moment longer, like he was trying to decide if he believed her. Then he took a knife out of a sheath at his hip and held it up so she could see the wicked blade, long and serrated. The thought of that thing sliding into her ribs made her eyes go wide and her body tremble. A menacing grin spread across Wolf's lips, and he nodded like he knew exactly what she was thinking. He knelt at her feet and cut the duct tape in one swipe, demonstrating the sharpness of the blade. He stood and slid the knife into his sheath, then clamped his fingers around Jessica's upper arm. Walk. Waves of terror crashed over her. They were about to go inside a building where no one would be able to see that she needed help. And what if there were others inside? Would her chances to escape diminish? Was her best chance at that very moment? Frantic to get away, she also knew that if she did anything, Wolf would kill her. She'd seen it in his eyes. Act like you're going to cooperate, she told herself. Then wait for the right moment to bolt. It felt counterintuitive to let Wolf guide her toward the house, but she did it anyway, praying mightily the entire time. Chapter 12. Matt What was taking them so long? Okay, Matt knew it wasn't unreasonable to be gone for several hours on a run, especially with the task of taking solar panels off of roofs, but every minute Jessica was gone seemed like an hour. He wanted her back home, safe. With his legs still healing, Matt had been assigned to work in the garden. He sat on a small stool and leaned forward to pull weeds. It was awkward, but he wanted to contribute however he could. Only trouble was, the garden was behind the house and he couldn't see the driveway. Instead, he kept his ears tuned for the sound of a vehicle crunching up the driveway. Then it came. He stood as quickly as he could and made his way around the back of the house to the front. A black charger had pulled through the gate and was approaching the house. Confused, 
Matt tilted his head. Who was this? Jeff had let the car through, so it had to be someone they knew. It must be someone from Walter's group. Disappointed, Matt frowned. Still, he stayed where he was. The car drew closer. Matt peered at the driver. When he recognized Derek behind the wheel and Chris in the passenger seat, he recoiled. Where was Derek's truck? He squinted, trying to see into the back seat where Jessica would be sitting, but he didn't see her. Was she lying down, asleep, or was she injured? His eyes widened in alarm, and he moved as fast as he could toward the charger. Derek got out before Matt reached the car. At the look on Derek's face, Matt's heart dropped into his stomach. Something had happened to Jessica, something bad. Matt stopped, his eyes riveted to Derek. Where is she? Derek's shoulders drooped. I'm so sorry, Matt. I don't know where she is. All the blood drained from his face. What? How could Derek not know where she was? Derek walked closer to Matt, stopping a couple of feet in front of him. He looked him right in the eye. It's my fault. I never should have let her go into that house alone. Matt knew Derek was cautious. That was the only reason he hadn't argued more vehemently with Jessica when she'd insisted on going. He'd trusted Derek to keep her safe. What happened? Derek explained what had transpired, ending with, Chris and I drove around for an hour, but we couldn't find her or the truck. We need more people. Matt couldn't believe this. Some random men had taken his Jess. It felt as if someone had put a vice around his chest and was squeezing. What was happening to her that very minute? Were they hurting her? Was she even still alive? Frantic to find her, he turned to Jeff and Emily, who had joined them and had heard the story. We need to go, now. Everyone nodded. Glad they were all willing to help, though he'd expected nothing less, Matt scanned the vehicles parked in the driveway. We have four vehicles. I'll take my truck. Derek, you take the charger. He turned to Chris and Jeff, but before he said a word, Jeff said, I'll take Frank's truck. Chris nodded. I'll take my SUV. Wait, Matt said as a new thought occurred to him. Who will be here to keep watch? I'll be here, Emily said with a smile. And then there's Dylan, Frank, Paisley, Amy, Brooke, and Kayla. She placed a hand on Matt's arm. You guys go find Jessica. We've got it covered here. At the mention of Dylan, Matt knew he needed to tell his kids what was happening. In fact, he wanted Dylan to come with him. He'd proven to be a very able young man. No need to tell Dylan, he said with a grim smile. He's coming with me. Emily nodded. Okay. As if they knew they were talking about them, Dylan, Kayla, and Brooke came out of the house and approached the group. What's going on? Kayla asked, her expression happy and open. Matt didn't want to tell her the devastating news, but he had to. He swallowed over the giant knot in his throat. It's mom. She's been... she's been taken. Taken? Dylan asked, his eyes wide. What are you talking about? Matt didn't want to stand around explaining, so he turned to Emily. Will you explain the situation to the girls? He shifted his gaze to Dylan. Come with me. Wait, Kayla said, her forehead furrowed. I want to come. No way, Matt immediately said, his head swinging from side to side. There was no way in hell he'd let either Kayla or Brooke anywhere near where Jessica had been taken. Not with the kind of people out there who would take a wife and mother away from her family for, well, for unthinkable reasons. Kayla must have read the emotion in his face, because she immediately backed down. Okay, she hugged him. Be safe, Dad. I love you. He held her tight. I love you, too. He motioned for Brooke, his unofficially adopted daughter, to join the circle. She did and after a moment, he released them. Keep things secure here. I'll be back with Mom before the end of the day. He just hoped that was a promise he could keep.
Chapter 13 Jessica They entered the house. It was stuffy inside, and quiet. No one else seemed to be there. Relieved that she only had Wolf and Shaggy to deal with, Jessica felt her body relax a fraction. Wolf led her to a couch where he gave her a shove, making her sit down. At least her legs were free. She hoped he wasn't going to bind them again. Stay here, he commanded. Then he turned to Shaggy. Keep an eye on her. I'll unload the truck. Shaggy glared at her, then sat in a recliner adjacent to the couch. Studiously ignoring him, Jessica watched as Wolf brought in all the boxes of food and supplies that she, Derek, and Chris had collected. Then he brought in the inverter and solar panels, leaning the panels against a wall. He turned his attention to her, which sent chills cascading down her spine. He gestured to the inverter and panels. What were you going to do with this stuff? She stared back, unable to speak. He huffed a sigh and stomped over to her. She shrank back. He grabbed the edge of the duct tape on her mouth and ripped it off. She gasped at the stinging pain, but didn't complain. Not after she'd been trying to work the tape off. Answer my question. Would telling him the truth hurt anything? She didn't see how it could. Plus, she was trying to convey the fiction that she was cooperative, that she would do whatever they told her to. How else to get them to drop their guard? Maybe she did regret kicking Shaggy in the face after all. Meeting Wolf's gaze, but then quickly looking away to convey her pretend submissiveness, she said, We wanted to make electricity. Wasn't it obvious? They were solar panels, after all. Even if these guys were stupid, that didn't make them any less dangerous. She lifted her eyes to Wolf's. He stared at her for several moments, making her distinctly uncomfortable. Do you know how to hook it up? Wolf asked. She wished she did. That would give her leverage. Unfortunately, she had no clue. She shook her head. No, I'm a, was, a dental hygienist. Maybe that was something that would get their guard down. If they needed something done with their teeth, that is. Which, going by their personal hygiene, dental care was low on their list of priorities. When Wolf didn't reply, Jessica asked, What do you want with me? Although she had a pretty good idea, she wanted to draw him into a conversation. Try to get him to see her as a person. My name's Jessica, by the way. He frowned and picked up the inverter, which he examined. This gave her an idea. I know someone who could hook that up for you. Then you'd have an endless supply of electricity. He paused his study of the inverter and looked at her. Who? Friends of mine. Of course, her friends would kill him, so he wouldn't actually get to use the electricity, but he didn't have to know that. What would they want in return? Was he really that stupid? They'd want me, she said shoving down the hope that he would agree to trade her for electricity, as if he would ever turn her over willingly. Then again, maybe he wanted the electricity so he could play video games. Maybe it would be worth it to him to make the trade. Nah, he said, crushing her deepest desire. He turned his attention back to the inverter. I'll figure it out myself. She glanced at Shaggy. He'd fallen asleep in the recliner. Her gaze traveled back to Wolf, whose back was to her. If she was Derek, she would already be off of the couch and taking Wolf down. But she wasn't Derek, and her hands were still bound. Patience, Jess. Patience. She leaned her head back and closed her eyes, silently praying for a way to escape. Chapter 14 Matt Derek handed a walkie to Matt. I'm not sure of the range, but we'll each take one. He and Dylan, Derek, Chris, and Jeff were about to head out. They'd quickly armed themselves, 
before going over a map of the area where Jessica had been taken and where Derek and Chris had already looked, planning where each of them would search. Matt handed the walkie to Dylan, who had heard the story of what had happened from Emily as Matt was studying the map with the others. Again, Derek said to Matt, sorrow clear in his eyes. I am so sorry. In the short time since he'd gotten the news, it had never occurred to Matt to blame Derek. He needed to make that clear. Look, I don't blame you. I should have tried harder to talk her out of going. His throat hurt as he tried to swallow over the huge knot that wouldn't go away. If we can't find her, I'll never be able to forgive myself. Knock it off, Jeff said. The only ones to blame are the losers who took her. Now let's go find the jackholes and send them straight to hell. Despite himself, Matt smiled. Count on Jeff to keep it simple. Roger that. Matt and Dylan got into Matt's truck, and the other three got in their vehicles. Derek led the way, and as they drove to the area where Jessica was last seen, Matt constantly scanned, on the lookout for either Jessica or Derek's truck. At a prearranged spot, Matt and Dylan split off from the others and began slowly driving up and down every single street. Matt knew what Derek's truck looked like, but he had no idea if Jessica's kidnappers would have pulled it into a garage or not. He desperately hoped they'd made the mistake of parking it where it would be visible. Dylan was quiet in the passenger seat, his head moving as he scanned his side of the road. Never taking his eyes away from the search, Matt said, I appreciate you coming. Of course, Dylan said. I want to find Mom, too. I know you do, but I'm proud of you for agreeing to come without hesitation. Matt paused a moment, feeling choked up at all his son had been through over the past few weeks. You've become a man, Dylan. He glanced at his son to see Dylan beaming under his praise. They both went back to searching. No one was around, not a single person. He thought he would have gotten used to the way things were, but he hadn't. Maybe he never would. He didn't want to have to. What kind of world was it where his wife could be snatched off the street and there was nothing he could do but go out and look for her himself? No police to call, no way to alert the public. Not that anyone would care. Everyone was too focused on their own survival to worry about anyone else. His walkie squawked on Dylan's lap. Calm check, Derek said. Dylan picked up the walkie. Copy. Chris and Jeff responded too. It was comforting to know there was a way to reach them. But for how long? Chapter 15. Jessica. Shaggy was still sleeping on the recliner, and Wolf was sharpening his wicked-looking knife. I have to go to the bathroom, Jessica said. Wolf jerked his head up like he'd forgotten she was there. Then he squinted, like he wasn't sure how to handle this unexpected situation. That told her she must be the first woman they'd kidnapped. Lucky her. He sheathed his knife and stood. Fine. He crossed the small space, stopping in front of her. Get up. She shrank back. She couldn't help it. He scared her. Glowering at her, he said, Thought you had to go. She actually did, but that wasn't the real reason she'd asked. Crushing her fear, she got to her feet. This way. Wolf started moving toward a hallway, his gaze barely leaving Jessica. He stopped outside a filthy bathroom, gesturing with his head to its interior. There you go. She held up her bound hands. Please? It pained her to have to politely ask, but she needed to keep playing the role of docile captive. He clenched his jaw as he stared at her, but after a moment, he used his knife to cut through the duct tape, freeing her hands. It felt wonderful to have the duct taped off and to be able to use her hands. She moved her wrists in circles to get the blood flowing. Then she swallowed her pride and met Wolf's dead eyes. Thank you, he grunted in reply. Squeezing past him, 
She went into the bathroom and closed the door. The stench was nearly unbearable. Apparently, they didn't have running water or a septic system like she had at the farm, which now seemed like the most luxurious thing in the world. Ignoring the stink, she immediately turned her eyes to the window, but when she saw that it was a horizontal rectangle high above the bathtub that didn't even open, her hopes of escaping that way were dashed. No wonder Wolf was fine with her going in there on her own. She really did need to pee, but she wasn't sure she was willing to use these facilities. The space had to be crawling with germs. The bathroom looked like it hadn't been cleaned for months before the pandemic and had only gotten worse since. Taking advantage of not being observed, she knelt in front of the vanity and opened the doors, on the hunt for anything she could use as a weapon. There were half-used bottles of shampoo, a leaking can of shaving cream, an overflowing trash can with used tissues littering the space around it. Trying not to gag, Jessica moved aside the items in front, her gaze probing the depths of the space. Something in the back caught her eye. She reached in and lifted it out, a smile slowly curving her lips. A metal nail file. Standing, she slipped it into her back pocket, making sure her t-shirt covered the part that stuck up. Then, with undisguised disgust, she used the bucket that these guys were obviously using as a toilet. When she was finished, she opened the door to the bathroom, expecting to see Wolf waiting for her when she saw Shaggy instead. She recoiled. Where's Wolf? She began, catching herself before saying the name she called him in her head. Where's your friend? She asked instead. Shaggy grinned. Left to run an errand, his grin changed to a smirk. I'm in charge now. Blood stained the front of his shirt and his lips were swollen. Clear evidence of what she'd done to him. She would do more if she had the chance. Still, she didn't want to antagonize him. Not yet, anyway. Wanting to have more space to mount an attack, she asked, May I go into the living room? He stared at her for several moments. Then he stepped back, letting her lead the way. Once she was in the living room, she turned and faced him. Do you have any water? From where she stood, she could just see into the kitchen, which was where Wolf had carried the boxes he'd stolen from them. She knew there were bottles of water in those boxes, and she was thirsty, but she also wanted to distract Shaggy so she could catch him off guard. He scowled at her. Not sure you deserve any, not after what you've done to me. Managing to push on a contrite expression, she said, I'm sorry about what I did to you. I was just scared. He narrowed his eyes, like he was trying to decide if she meant it. She didn't, not one bit. Well, maybe the scared part, but definitely not the sorry part. Stay here, he finally said. Nodding, she watched as he took the few steps into the kitchen. While his back was turned, she took the nail file out of her back pocket, gripping it in her hand and pressing it against her leg to keep it hidden. With a water bottle in his hand, Shaggy walked toward her. Jessica stared at him, picturing what she was about to do. Could she really do it? The boss is gonna like you, Shaggy said his gaze sliding up and down her body. Oh yeah, she could do this. Not reacting to his comment and not reaching for the water bottle, she let him walk closer. He held the bottle in his right hand while his left arm hung loosely at his side. The moment he began lifting his arm to hand her the bottle, she struck, driving the nail file into his left carotid artery. His mouth flew open as his eyes went wide and the water bottle fell from his hand. She yanked the nail file out of his neck. Blood pumped out in a horrifying arc. He sank to the floor in an ever-growing puddle of his own blood. Jessica stared at him a moment, stunned by what she'd done. She'd thought she would feel a sense of guilt at taking his life, but to her utter surprise, she had zero regrets. This man and his buddy had kidnapped her with terrible things in mind. They'd had zero regrets, too. 
As Shaggy lay there, rapidly dying, Jessica took his gun from his hip. Then she peered out the front window. Wolf had yet to return. Not wanting to risk running into Wolf, Jessica turned and ran into the kitchen, then fled out the back door. Chapter 16 Derek With each minute that passed with no sign of Jessica, Derek's guilt grew tenfold. He couldn't begin to imagine how Matt felt. Sighing in frustration as he drove, he noticed a home improvement store up ahead. He scanned the few vehicles in the parking lot, not expecting to see anything interesting. Then he saw it. His truck. Head jerking back in surprise, he hit the brakes, then grabbed the walkie. I've got something. Is it Jessica? Matt said almost immediately. Don't know yet. Looks like my truck, though. He gave his location. I'm on my way. There was no response from Chris or Jeff. Must be out of range. Meet me on the street on the north side of the building, Derek said into the walkie. Roger that, Dylan replied. Five minutes later, Matt and Dylan arrived, parking behind Derek. Derek got out. Matt and Dylan did as well. They stood on the side of Matt's truck that made them less visible in case the person who had driven Derek's truck happened to come outside. Is mom in there? Dylan asked, his face showing a mix of hope and worry. Derek shook his head. Don't know. Need to do some recon to find out. If Jessica was inside, Derek was worried about what was happening to her. He didn't want Matt or Dylan to witness what she may be going through. You two stay here and keep an eye on the front. I'll recon. Matt opened his mouth, but before he could argue, Derek held up his hand. I know you want to go in there, but let's be honest. Your bum leg will slow you down and make you less stealthy. He paused a beat. Let me do this. I won't be long. Matt's jaw clenched, but then he nodded. Relieved he hadn't had to argue, Derek turned and trotted away, heading to the corner of the building before quickly making his way to the entrance. With his gun leading the way, he went through the broken glass that used to be the doors. Sunlight streamed in through the skylights and the ceiling, allowing him to see around the interior fairly well. The sound of someone rummaging through the shelves reached Derek. He crept toward that area, on high alert for anyone on watch who might try to ambush him. It didn't take long to find the aisle where the noise was coming from. Peering around the corner, Derek saw a man, alone, filling a shopping cart with various gauges of wire. Jessica was nowhere to be seen. Not sure if that was a good sign or not. Had they already killed her, or was she somewhere else entirely? He studied the man. Average height, on the thin side, but he still looked like he could put up a fight. The man was focused on his task. Derek noticed several tattoos on the man's arms, including one of a wolf. He considered whether he should attack the man and question him, but quickly decided it would be more productive to follow the man after he'd finished his shopping. Derek made his way out of the store and back to Matt and Dylan. At the look of hope and devastation on Matt's face, Derek said, She's not in there. Matt closed his eyes as he exhaled. Then he ran his fingers through his hair. Did you question him? No, we'll follow him when he comes out. He'll lead us right to her. Matt's gaze darted to the truck still parked in the lot. Then he met Derek's eyes. Right. We'll all go in my car, Derek said. Matt nodded and went around to the passenger side. Derek got behind the wheel. Once all three of them were inside with the doors closed, they waited. Fifteen minutes later, the man came out, pushing a shopping cart in front of him. That him? Matt asked. Derek nodded. Yeah. They watched as the man moved the items from the shopping cart into the bed of the truck. The man seemed oblivious to the fact that he was being watched. Good. The man got behind the wheel of the truck and drove out of the parking lot, turning right onto the empty street. With no other cars on the road, it would be challenging to follow him without being noticed. Still, 
Derek would give it his best shot. Derek turned the charger around, then stopped at the corner. He crept forward enough to see his truck, but didn't pull onto the street just yet. Once the man was a good distance away, Derek turned onto the street. He drove slow enough to keep a healthy distance without losing sight of the man. The man turned into a neighborhood. This would be the hardest part, because Derek would have to get closer to the man to keep him in view. He just hoped the man was too preoccupied to notice them trailing him. I don't see him, Matt said, after they'd made two more turns. His voice was tinged with panic. Had the man seen them, or had he gotten lucky? Either way, they'd lost him. Chapter 17 Jessica Jessica didn't know where to go. She had no idea how to get back to the farm, and she had no clue which way Wolf had gone. She couldn't risk walking in the street. If Wolf spotted her, he'd come after her for sure. It had only been a few minutes since she'd killed Shaggy and escaped. Now she was running in an almond orchard that grew behind the houses in the neighborhood, several houses away from the one where she'd been held prisoner. Panting from exertion and a panic she couldn't control, she paused and looked at the house closest to her. Was anyone home? Maybe she should check. Maybe they would help her. Heart slamming against her ribs, she darted to the back of the house and pounded on the French doors. Is anyone home? She didn't call out too loudly, just in case Wolf was looking for her. No one came to the door. Maybe she could hide inside. She was tired and thirsty. She'd been through an ordeal and needed a minute. She turned the knob. To her great relief, it was unlocked. Or maybe that was a bad sign. Maybe that meant someone was living there, but just wasn't home. Before she stepped over the threshold, she paused and listened and sniffed the air. No stench of a decomposing corpse, and no sound of anyone inside. Still, she was nervous as hell. She pulled out the gun she'd taken off of Shaggy and held it in the low ready position. Wait, she should make sure it was actually loaded. Relying on the training Derek had been giving her and the others, she dropped the magazine. It was full of ammo. Sighing with relief, she inserted the magazine, then pulled back the slide, putting a round in the chamber. She stepped through the door, then took her time clearing the house. It was the first time she'd done it on her own. As she went from room to room, she felt more certain that no one had been there in a while. A fine layer of dust covered everything, as if no one had been inside for weeks. Once the house had been cleared, she went back to the kitchen. Thirstier than ever, she opened the cupboards on the hunt for something to drink. A bit of food would be nice, too. But she found nothing. The place had been cleared out. Whoever lived there must have taken everything edible before fleeing. She went into the living room and sat on the couch, dislodging a cloud of dust. She couldn't stay there. She realized that now. When Wolf found Shaggy dead and Jessica missing... He would be furious. He would search the neighborhood until he found her. And then what? Would he kill her? What about the boss they kept talking about? When was he supposed to arrive? This was such a mess. She just needed to get back to the farm, back to her family. Then she would be safe. An idea struck her. She stood and went into the garage. Yes, there was a car parked inside. Now if she could just find the keys. She went back in the house and began looking, digging through every drawer, in the kitchen, in the bedroom, in the room that looked like an office, even in the bathroom. No keys. Wait, maybe the keys were already in the car. With hope building, Jessica got in the car. She dropped the visor, looked in the center console and the glove box. She even got out and looked under the seat which was difficult with how dark it was, but she wasn't about to open the garage to let light in, not with Wolf's whereabouts unknown. Still no keys. Sighing in frustration, she sat in the driver's seat 
and shook her head. Her gaze traveled to the glove box again, which is when she got another idea. She reached over and took out the map she'd noticed earlier, then carried it back into the house. After spreading it on the counter, she searched for the location of the farm. There it was. Okay, now she just needed to determine where she was, and then she could trace the path she needed to follow to get home. What she wouldn't give for a smartphone with GPS capabilities. Life had been so easy before, at least when it came to finding places and getting information. Now, though, every single thing she did required effort. But that effort always paid off. No matter what, even if she had to walk, she would make it home to her family. Feeling a renewed sense of hope, she went to the front window and pulled back a corner of the curtain. No street signs were visible. She would have to go outside and find a street sign to figure out where she was. After folding the map, she tucked it in her back pocket. It stuck out, but that didn't matter. It was like gold to her, like her own personal treasure map. She hadn't marked the farm with an X, though. She knew where the farm was, and that was all that mattered. Making sure the gun was securely tucked in her waistband, she went through the French doors and into the backyard. As she walked, she stayed close to the trees in the orchard that ran behind the houses, pausing frequently to listen for Derek's truck, for Wolf's return. As she reached each house, she took a moment to watch for occupants, but no one seemed to be around. Then she craned her head to see if any street signs were visible. None so far. Soon, she would need to stop and look for water. But first, she was determined to learn the name of the street she was on. Finally, she saw a cross street. Daring to approach the sign on the corner, she crept forward until she could read the names of the streets going in each direction. Elated to have that information, she dashed to the nearest house and approached the front door. A bright red X was painted on the wood. Great. A corpse was inside. One that had died of the flu. But that also meant that there was a possibility of water and food inside. Willing to brave the stink of death, Jessica hurried up the walk and to the front door. Being extra cautious, she knocked, then waited a good 30 seconds. No reply. She tried the knob. Locked. No surprise there. Nowhere near ready to give up, she went around to the garage's man door, as Derek had taught her. It was locked, too. No problem. She'd seen Derek break in this kind of door before. He would told her that you were supposed to kick the area where the locking mechanism was. She lifted her foot and slammed it into the spot where she'd seen Derek do it. The door didn't fly open like it did for him. Not discouraged, but with some discomfort in her foot and leg, she considered shooting the lock, but didn't want to broadcast her location. Instead, she kicked the same area again. This time, the door burst inward. A smile slowly curved her lips. She went through the door, silently praying that the door leading into the house would be unlocked. Much to her relief, it was. But the moment the door opened, the stench of a rotting corpse stung her nostrils and made her gag. Just look for water. Breathing through her mouth, which only helped marginally, she sprinted into the kitchen and yanked open cupboards. Fortunately, it didn't take long to find a stash of bottled water, as well as a decent supply of food in the walk-in pantry. There were boxes of cereal, boxes of crackers, canned food, as well as baking supplies. But the thing that caught her eye was the large box of granola bars. She grabbed a bottle of water and a granola bar and closed the door to the pantry. It was pitch black, but the smell wasn't so bad now. She took a moment to gulp down the entire water bottle. Then, by feel, she tore open the wrapping on the granola bar and ate that. Feeling slightly better, she opened the door to the pantry, cautiously. She didn't want to find someone on the other side of the door, although with the stink of death in the house, she didn't really think that would happen. No one appeared. Deciding it would be prudent to carry some food and water with her, who knew how long it would take her to get home, 
she went to the mudroom that led to the garage in hopes of finding a backpack. To her delight, a dusty Star Wars backpack was hanging from a hook. She couldn't help herself. She stared at the image from Star Wars, letting memories of watching the movies with her family before the world had ended wash over her. Softly sighing, she took the backpack from the hook, silently thanking whoever it had belonged to. She unzipped it. School books and papers were stashed inside. With a reverence that took her by surprise, she removed each item and gently set each one on the bench. These had belonged to a child who was probably dead, maybe lying in one of the bedrooms at that very moment. It only served to remind her how lucky she and her family were to be alive. Once the pack was empty, she carried it to the pantry and filled it with bottles of water, granola bars, and crackers before setting it aside. Then, realizing she was getting somewhat used to the awful smell, she took the map out of her back pocket and spread it on the counter. It took a couple of minutes, but she eventually figured out where she was. She traced the path from her current location to the farm. Looked like she was less than 15 miles from home. Still a long distance if she had to go on foot, but maybe she could find another way. Feeling more optimistic than she had since she'd been kidnapped, she opened the door to the garage. No car. Are you kidding me? She muttered. But when she heard the sound of a vehicle driving by, she softly closed the door and raced to the front window. It was Derek's truck. Wolf was back. Chapter 18 Jessica Panic, powerful and swift, surged through her. She was too close to the house where Wolf was headed. He would find Shaggy dead and her gone, and he would roar with fury. He would take that wicked-looking knife out of its sheath and hunt her down. He would kill her slowly and painfully, sawing through her flesh with the serrated edge of the knife. Trembling with fear, Jessica was momentarily paralyzed. Where could she go? Then she reminded herself that she had a gun. But so did Wolf. She needed some sort of advantage. He doesn't know which way you went, she reminded herself. That was her advantage. Maybe she should stay where she was. If he came to this house, she would shoot him before he found her. She would ambush him. Feeling marginally better, she planted herself beside the front window, a finger on the blinds as she watched for him to approach. But what if he came through the back? She wouldn't see him. She thought about the booby traps they'd set up at the farm. She could do something similar, right? Not a booby trap, but an alarm. Heart thumping painfully against her ribs, she barely registered the awful smell of death as she raced into the kitchen and pulled open the cupboards. It didn't take long to find what she was looking for, pots and pans and metal bowls. She took them all out and placed them on the counter, then selected a few and carried those to the garage door. She set them on the floor next to the door, then opened the door to test the alarm. When the door swung open, the metal bowls clanged together in a gratifying way. Smiling and nodding, she closed and locked the door, then placed the bowls back the way she'd had them. Satisfied with that alarm, she did the same thing next to the front door. Then she went to the sliding glass door at the back. An alarm there wouldn't work. Wolf would see the items through the glass and be able to avoid them. Plus, seeing the makeshift alarm would alert him to the fact that she was inside. Then she noticed a section of PVC pipe resting in the track. Okay, the homeowners had already taken care of the problem. The door wouldn't slide open with that in the way. And if Wolf broke the glass, she would hear that. Feeling more confident, she went back to her post at the front window to keep watch. Twenty minutes later, she saw him. He was marching down the road, his face a mask of fury. He must have searched each of the houses between his place and the house she was in now. 
Jessica dropped the slat back into place and hid behind a recliner. With her heart in her throat and her gun in her hand, she waited. Moments later, she heard Wolf trying the knob on the front door. Maybe when he saw it was locked and the red X on the door, he would leave. The sound of a gun blasting the lock shattered Jessica's hopes. Fresh panic made her want to scream, but she clamped her lips closed. A moment later, she heard Wolf kick the door open before it swung inward. Pots and pans clattered as the door violently shoved her makeshift alarm across the floor. That's when Jessica realized her mistake. Now Wolf would know she was inside. Where are you, you little bitch? He called out. Jessica's heart pounded so hard, she feared she might go into cardiac arrest. Squeezing her eyes closed, she listened to his footsteps. It sounded like he was going into the kitchen, which was away from her position. She opened her eyes and moved her head ever so slowly to peer around the side of the recliner. Wolf's back was to her as he walked into the kitchen. From her vantage point, she couldn't tell if he was holding his gun. Terror crashed over her in waves. If he found her, she was dead. She would never see her family again, and they wouldn't even know if she was dead or alive or where her body lay. She couldn't let that happen. No one was coming to save her. She had to save herself. Gathering her courage, she slowly rose to a squat, stopping when she was high enough to see over the back of the recliner. Her eyes slid to the front door, which stood open. She could run, but Wolf would be right behind her. No, she had to finish this. Finish him. Drawing in a deep breath through her nose, she slowly and quietly exhaled through her mouth, as she rested the barrel of her gun on the back of the recliner. I'm gonna find you, she heard Wolf call out. And then the fun will begin. Oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. Running through the front door looked more appealing than ever, but she knew she had to face her fears. She crouched back down behind the recliner, her gun pointed at the space where Wolf would appear. To calm herself, she silently counted off the seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six. Then she heard his footsteps. He was coming toward the living room. Bracing herself for the confrontation, she reminded herself to breathe. A moment later, she saw him. His gun was held in his hand, but he didn't see her. His eyes were focused on the hallway that was off of the living room. He strode confidently in that direction, like he was sure she was hiding in one of the bedrooms. Though she wanted to shoot him, the angle was all wrong and she didn't want to miss. Instead, she watched him go. He disappeared down the hall. Forcing down her nearly overwhelming fear, she unsteadily got to her feet. With her ears straining to hear where he was, which was nearly impossible since he was walking on carpet, she crept across the living room and toward the hallway. At the junction of the hallway and living room, she pressed her back against the wall and peered around the corner. No sign of him. He must be in a bedroom. But which one? With her gun aimed in front of her, she resumed her position with her back against the wall which would keep her out of Wolf's view when he came around the corner. A few moments later, she heard him muttering under his breath. He was coming. Half a second later, she sensed his presence, like his bulk was disrupting the molecules around her. Then he was there, but his back was to her as he turned from the hallway into the living room. His head moved from side to side as he scanned the space, looking right where she'd been hiding. This was it. This was her chance. She lifted her gun and aimed it at his back. The larger the area, the better the chance for hitting her target. That's what Derek had said. She squeezed the trigger. Nothing happened. Panic engulfed her. He would see her. He would kill her. 
But squeezing the trigger hadn't made any noise. The trigger was locked. It hadn't moved. Wolf still didn't know she was there. Forcing herself to focus, she remembered what Derek had said about the gun's safety. Quickly checking the gun, she flicked the safety off, then aimed it once again at Wolf's back. Bracing herself, she slid her finger to the trigger, then squeezed. Boom! Wolf jerked and cried out, but he didn't fall. She took a step closer to him and squeezed the trigger again. Another ear-splitting boom. This time, Wolf fell to his knees, but he wasn't dead. With his gun still in his hand, he began turning toward Jessica. She took another step closer. She aimed at his head. Their eyes met. His were filled with cold fury. He wanted her dead. She wouldn't let him have his wish. She pulled the trigger. A burst of red spray exploded from his head. He fell to the floor. Breathing rapidly, Jessica stared at Wolf. He didn't move. He couldn't. He was dead. The hole in his head made that clear. Her heart was like a jackhammer in her chest, and she had to consciously breathe in and out, in and out. She lowered her gun, her fingers still tightly wrapped around the pistol grip. She'd done it. She'd saved herself. She tucked her gun in the back of her waistband. Then, as the adrenaline started to recede, she began to tremble, taking a steadying breath. After a moment, she began to equalize. It was time to go home. With a mix of elation and horror, she devised her plan. She would go to Wolf's house, she would get Derek's truck, and she would drive home. Grimacing, she dug through Wolf's pockets, coming up with the keys to Derek's truck. She also took his gun. Next, she went into the kitchen and shouldered the backpack before walking out the front door. The air was blissfully fresh and clean as she forced one foot in front of the other. She'd killed two men that day. The thought was horrifying, but she would do it again in a heartbeat. She'd had to do it. It had been self-defense. Shaking off her memories of those awful moments, she made her way toward the street. Certain of her plan to get home, she walked boldly down the street toward Wolf's house. Nearly there, the sound of a vehicle filled the air. A black charger appeared at the end of the street. How could she have been so stupid? She'd been so preoccupied with what she'd been through that she'd completely forgotten that Wolf and Shaggy's boss was supposed to be coming. The charger's engine grew louder, like whoever was driving it had seen her and was coming for her. Fresh panic engulfed her. Her gaze darted toward the orchard. There was nowhere else to go. She had to get away, had to hide. Run, her mind screamed. Without hesitation, she obeyed, running flat out toward the orchard. Chapter 19 Matt There she is, Matt yelled, not believing his eyes. Jessica was walking toward them, alone. Then she stopped and looked their way. After a tiny hesitation, she darted away, running as fast as he'd ever seen her go. No! He knew she couldn't hear him, but he willed her to stop, to know it was him. It didn't work. She ran like the devil himself was after her. Derek pulled the car to the curb at the spot where she dashed toward the orchard. Barely waiting for the car to come to a halt, Matt threw the door open and leapt out. Pain radiated up his bad leg. Ignoring the pain, he screamed, Jessica, stop! He could see her. She'd nearly reached the orchard. Hobbling after her, he didn't care that his leg was screaming at him to stop. He kept going. Dylan flew past him. Mom, mom, wait! Proud of his son, Matt tried to keep up, but struggled. Glancing over her shoulder, Jessica slowed, then stopped. Dylan, she cried, is that you? 
Mom! Matt kept going, watching as Dylan reached Jessica. They threw their arms around each other. Derek appeared beside Matt, slowing his pace to stay beside him as he asked, You okay? Matt realized tears were streaming down his face. They'd found Jessica. She was alive. Ecstatic, Matt turned to Derek with a face-breaking grin. I'm great. Eventually, Matt and Derek reached Jessica and Dylan. Jessica flung herself into Matt's arms. He held her tight, not caring that his face was soaked with tears. After several long moments, she drew away and stared at him, her own face awash in tears. You found me. Using his thumbs, he wiped at her cheeks. Are you okay? Did they hurt you? He wanted to slowly kill the men who had taken her. A smile lifted her lips. I'm fine. Then she shook her head. They didn't hurt me. All the tension he'd been holding left his body. She was all right, unharmed. His eyes briefly closed. Then he opened them before wrapping her in his arms again. How did you find me? Jessica asked. He explained how they'd followed Derek's truck, but had lost it. After that, we just drove up one street after the other, looking for you. Where are the men who took you? Derek asked. Matt wanted to know the same thing. He wanted to get his hands on them, make them suffer. He released Jessica. They're dead, she said. I, I killed them. Matt listened in stunned amazement as Jessica told them what had happened. She pointed to a nearby house. That's the house where they took me. Together, the four of them walked to the house. When they reached it, Derek motioned for them to stay outside while he cleared it. Matt was fine with that. His priority was keeping Jessica safe. A short time later, Derek came back out. No one's here. His gaze went to Jessica. Just the guy you killed? Matt looked at her, wondering how she felt. She wore a grim expression as she nodded. Derek shifted his eyes to Dylan. Help me get our stuff from the house. We'll load it back in my truck. As the pair carried the solar panels and other things out to Derek's truck, Matt turned to Jessica, studying her face, trying to read her eyes. How are you holding up? She turned to him. I'm okay. Her voice was upbeat, like she was proud, and kind of shocked that she'd been able to save herself, like her confidence had grown exponentially. He was amazed by her strength, amazed by her. I was so worried. Such an understatement. Nodding, she lay her head against his chest. Matt tried to imagine how Jessica had felt as she'd had to deal with being kidnapped, then killing the two men who had taken her. It could have ended very differently, but she'd come out on top. His confidence in her ability to survive soared. You astound me, he murmured. She lifted her head and faced him, her expression solemn. I did what I had to do. He smiled at her. I know, he chuckled. What I didn't know was that you were such a badass. With a tilt of her head that conveyed her own surprise, she said, I didn't either. Derek and Dylan joined them. We're ready to go. What about the boss those guys talked about? Jessica asked. Derek shook his head. He's not here. He paused, his eyes on her. We can wait if you want. It's up to you. She looked thoughtful. Then she shook her head. I have no idea when he was supposed to return, but with Wolf and Shaggy dead, maybe he's not such a threat. Derek nodded. Let's get out of here. Matt and Jessica took the charger, while Derek and Dylan got in Derek's truck. They caravaned to the home improvement store and picked up Matt's truck. Then the three vehicles headed back to the farm, with Jessica driving the charger. As Matt drove, he heard Derek over the walkie calling for Jeff and Chris. After several tries, they both finally answered. We've got her. Over, Derek said. Matt grinned and looked in his rearview mirror to see Jessica and Dylan in the charger. Jeff and Chris both replied, expressing their relief. 
When everyone was back at the farm, there was a joyful reunion. I'm going to make a special meal, Sarah said, after she hugged Jessica. Matt was so appreciative of this group and how they'd dropped everything to come together to find his beloved wife. He literally couldn't have done it without them. At dinner that night, Matt could tell Jessica was relaxed, but tired. She'd given a shortened version of the events to everyone, downplaying her terror, but Matt remembered the way she'd taken off when she'd seen the charger approaching. She'd been absolutely petrified. He put his arm around her and tugged her close. She rested her head on his shoulder. So very grateful to have her safely home, he savored having her beside him. Walter's here, Brooke said as she walked into the covered patio area. She was on watch with Paisley and Chris. A moment later, Walter and his son-in-law Jack appeared. Everyone greeted them. Then Jack frowned deeply. We have a problem. Chapter 20 Derek Couldn't they have one evening free from worry? Derek sighed as he waited to hear the news Walter and Jack had brought. Jack pulled a flyer from his back pocket and handed it to Derek. In large type, the flyer said, Wanted for the murder of two state security officers. Beneath that were crystal clear pictures of both Derek and Jeff. Below their pictures, it said, Generous reward for any information leading to the apprehension of these fugitives. Crap, Derek muttered as he handed the flyer to Jeff. The pictures had obviously been taken at the DMV when he and Jeff had gone to check out the gun exchange several days earlier. Frowning deeply, he shook his head. Guess their cameras are working. Now it made sense why the man he'd tied to the tree had seemed to fear for his life, because he knew Derek had already killed. The men who had come upon him, Chris, and Jessica while they'd been taking the solar panels had seen the wanted poster, and they knew Derek was in this general area. Perfect. Derek looked at Jeff, who wadded up the flyer and tossed it into a nearby trash can. What is this about? Jack asked, his eyebrows furrowing as he pointed to the flyer Jeff had just thrown away. Jeff and I had a little run-in with a pair of state security officers. He did air quotes on their title. Care to elaborate? Walter asked, as he tilted his head like he was both curious and concerned. Jeff and I went to the DMV to check out their gun confiscation scheme. We brought guns we'd gotten off of Randy and the Emperors. Somehow those government guys knew the guns were stolen. Derek explained how he and Jeff had been hauled away in a van before the state security officers had pulled off in a random place in the middle of nowhere. They wanted us to go into an orchard with them. Derek glanced at Jeff, who was scowling. I don't think it was to take us on a tour to see the almond blossoms. So you killed them, Jack said. It wasn't a question. Derek nodded. Didn't have much choice. They've tossed due process out the window. They passed sentence on us without even formally charging us, let alone putting us on trial. Derek clenched his jaw. Tyranny is alive and well here in California, and with taking our guns, they won't even let us protect ourselves. Frowning deeply, he shook his head. The main people we need protection against is them. Jack nodded, like he agreed with Derek's conclusion and didn't hold his actions against him. What should we do? Emily asked, clearly worried that Jeff was a wanted man. I might be able to help, Matt said, drawing everyone's attention, including Derek's. What did you have in mind? Derek asked, happy for any help he could get. You said the guys at the DMV knew those guns were stolen. When Derek nodded, Matt went on. That means they have access to at least one central database, which means they have some sort of network set up. He grinned. You know, in my other life, I was a software engineer. 
Derek's eyebrows rose. It had never occurred to him that Matt's skill set could prove useful. Yeah, what are you thinking? Matt looked thoughtful. If I could get inside that DMV and onto one of their computers, I could access their system and... A smile slowly lifted his lips. I could plant a virus that could wreak havoc. Now that sounded awesome. Since I'll have to write the program on the fly, Matt continued, it will have to be a simple virus, but they won't be expecting it. He paused. And if they even have IT people, they can't have that many. He nodded as a grim smile played around the corners of his mouth. This has the potential to cripple them. Derek doubted it would stop the government from trying to confiscate everyone's guns, but it might at least slow them down if they couldn't keep track of what guns were out there and whatever else their database tracked. I'm in. Chapter 21. Matt. It was two days later, and the DMV was just ahead. Now that he was nearly there, Matt felt his gut roiling with nerves. He was a programmer, not a warrior. Then he reminded himself that he'd been in a few gunfights since the world as he'd known it had come to an end. He could do this. He hoped. Ready? Jessica asked from beside him as they walked hand in hand. He turned to her and nodded. The plan was for the two of them to pose as a couple in need. The idea had been that a man and a woman coming to the government for help would seem less threatening than two men. After what Jessica had been through, the way she'd gotten herself out of her deadly predicament, Matt had no doubt she could handle herself in this situation. Amazed by his wife, he gave her a side glance, then tugged his ball cap lower on his head. If he could keep the government's cameras from seeing his face, that would be ideal. Jessica, on the other hand, wore a blonde wig they'd managed to find. She'd done a good job of making it look like her real hair. If Matt didn't know it was a wig, he wouldn't have been able to tell. Together, they walked toward the DMV, their pace unhurried, like they were a down-on-their-luck couple, not a pair of rebellious citizens with ill intent. It was mid-morning, and as Matt opened the door to the DMV, he saw a handful of people waiting to exchange guns for supplies. The place was just as Derek and Jeff had described, right down to an armed man marching toward them, his face serious. Hands where I can see them, the man said. Slightly alarmed at the man's commanding tone, Matt did as instructed. Jessica did as well. The man searched them both, finding the one knife Matt had brought. Jessica wasn't armed at all. They hadn't wanted a repeat of what Derek and Jeff had gone through, so they hadn't brought any of the guns they'd taken off the Emperor's. And they certainly didn't want to give away their own identities, so they hadn't brought any of their own weapons. This is a gun buyback, the armed man said to Matt, his lip curling in annoyance, like he had a lot to do and Matt was wasting his time. We know, Jessica said, with pleading in her voice. Please, we need food. We're desperate. The man shifted his attention to her, his eyes sliding up and down her body. Then he frowned. Can't help you. Tears filled her eyes. But you're the government. I thought, I thought you were helping people. Matt was impressed with her acting. The man huffed an impatient sigh, then shook his head before pointing to the chairs. Take a seat. Okay, so far so good. They huddled together, their hands clasped like they were in dire straits. Surreptitiously glancing around, Matt counted two men behind the counter and two men in the main space, keeping an eye on the people who had come to exchange their guns for supplies. Several minutes later, a loud explosion in the near distance rocked the building. That was their signal. Matt watched as all four men raced toward the exit, their guns drawn. He knew that Chris and Derek would have left the area where they'd set off the explosion, taking cover close enough to see what was happening and to take further action if needed. 
The moment the men left the building, Matt and Jessica leapt to their feet and raced toward the counter. Hey, one man, a citizen, yelled at them. What are you doing? Matt ignored him, climbing over the counter to reach the offices in the back. But he heard Jessica say, If you want these supplies, help yourself. We won't stop you. Focused on his task, Matt barely registered the sound of gunfire as Jessica did her part, shooting out all the cameras from a gun she must have grabbed from behind the counter. His gaze swept the space. There, an open laptop sat on a desk. It didn't take long to access the database these guys were using, and for a brief moment, it felt like the time before, like the world hadn't gone to crap and he was sitting at his desk doing his run-of-the-mill job writing code. It was only when he heard more gunshots from somewhere outside that he was reminded of the stakes. Chapter 22 Derek Derek covered his ears as the blast of the explosion filled the air. He just hoped the timing was right and that Matt and Jessica hadn't run into any unexpected problems. Regardless, he had his own job to do. Seconds after the blast, four men burst through the doors of the DMV with guns drawn. Perfect. Among them was Mr. Friendly, the man who had arrested Derek and Jeff when they'd come to the DMV, the man who had ordered their execution. Taking cover around the corner of a nearby building, Derek put Mr. Friendly in his rifle's sights. His finger slid to the trigger, but he hesitated. Was it wrong to kill him and his cronies? In the world they used to live in, yes, absolutely. But now, Mr. Friendly had sent both him and Jeff to be killed for the crime of being in possession of stolen guns and giving them false names. No trial, no chance to defend themselves. Mr. Friendly had been eager to have them disappeared. Out of Derek's peripheral vision, he saw Chris aim his rifle at the men as well. I've got the one on the right, he murmured. Second thoughts poked at Derek. If he killed these security men from cover, he would be just as bad as Mr. Friendly. He lowered his rifle. Hold on. Chris turned to him, his rifle moving downward a fraction. What's wrong? Derek shook his head. When did we become cold-blooded killers, Chris? Lowering his gaze, Chris sighed. Then he met Derek's eyes with a nod. We're not. He paused a beat. But we do need to protect Matt and Jessica. Derek agreed. Absolutely. If those men become a threat, they're fair game. Nodding agreement, Chris moved a short distance away. Derek pointed his rifles at the men, who had spread out, obviously on the hunt for whomever had set off the explosion. How much time would Matt need? When Derek had asked him, Matt hadn't been able to give him a precise time. Derek just hoped it wouldn't be too long. A man ran out of the DMV offices, a box overflowing with food in his hands. Derek grinned. Good. The people were getting what the government should have been giving them anyway. Hey, one of the government bullies shouted at the fleeing man. Stop, or I'll shoot. Using a two-handed grip, the state security officer pointed his handgun at the man. Then, without giving the man a chance to stop, he shot him in the back several times. The box the man had been holding tumbled to the ground. Cans of food rolled on the pavement as the man collapsed to the ground. Holy crap, Derek muttered, as he put the government security man in his sights and, without hesitation, pulled the trigger. The security man fell to the pavement. Mr. Friendly and the other two security men spun in Derek and Chris's direction, their guns leading the way. Bullets pinged against the side of the building. Derek jerked back. Unseen by the security men, Chris poked his head out and took one of them out. That drew their fire in Chris's direction. Smiling grimly, Derek took aim at Mr. Friendly, who was marching in Chris's direction as he fired. 
and took the shot. Mr. Friendly's head exploded in a red mist. Not hesitating a moment, Derek took out the last security man. Having no idea if any other security people were supposed to show up, Derek wasn't about to relax. Instead, he continued to scan the area. A few more people left the DMV with boxes of supplies, but no one new showed up. An hour after the explosion had gone off, Matt and Jessica emerged. Exhaling in relief, Derek, with Chris right behind him, jogged over to the pair. How'd it go? Wearing a huge grin, Matt said, wrote the virus and planted it in their system. Nice. Matt looked around before shifting his gaze to Derek. What about you guys? Not feeling guilty in the slightest, Derek said, had to take them all out. Chris replayed the way one of the men had shot a citizen. Matt's eyebrows shot up. Wow, that's insane. I wonder how many people working for the government are the same way, Jessica said. Derek shook his head. Don't know, but I suspect it's a lot. Let's get out of here, Chris said. With a nod of agreement, the four of them set a brisk pace to Derek's truck. On the drive back to the farm, Derek couldn't help but wonder what would happen next. Chapter 23 Derek Three days later, Derek and Chris went on a supply run. As Chris drove the charger, Derek looked at the sheet of paper in his hand. This run might be a bit challenging. Chris glanced at him before looking back at the road. I know. Sarah had requested a number of medications. Between Matt getting shot in the leg and some other minor injuries among their group, Sarah had expressed concern over not having the medical supplies she would need in an emergency situation. She'd also said that she wanted to have a variety of antibiotics on hand. Derek had seen the wisdom in her request, so he'd been happy to go on the hunt for all the supplies she'd asked for. Now, as he and Chris drove to the first pharmacy they were going to hit, Derek watched for trouble. Soon, they arrived, hoping they'd be able to get many of the items on Sarah's list. When Derek saw that the shelves were virtually empty, he sighed and shook his head. As he and Chris got back in the charger, Chris asked where they should try next. Let's go to the hospital. We haven't scavenged there yet. Chris nodded. Sounds good. Maybe we'll even get lucky. Derek didn't hold out much hope, but it was worth a try. On the way there, they saw other people here and there, a man in his front yard working on a garden, a woman walking down the sidewalk pushing a shopping cart filled with blankets and other supplies. Not many people, but enough to tell him that people were still around. He didn't see anyone else driving, though. Getting fuel for vehicles was tough, not something the average person would be able to do. They'd only managed to do it because whenever they found a gas station that had a working generator, they stocked up on as much gas as they could store. Still, they had to be careful with their supply. Eventually, the gas would run out. After all, no one was delivering anything these days. There it is, Chris said as he angled into the parking lot, which had a number of cars parked in it. Derek let his gaze slide over the vehicles parked there. Could there be people inside actively helping those who were sick or injured? Do you think there are people in there? Doctors and nurses? Chris asked, obviously in the same mindset as Derek. Maybe, or these cars are abandoned from before. That seemed the more likely scenario. Chris parked the charger near the emergency room entrance and turned off the engine. He turned to Derek with a grin. Only one way to find out. After grabbing the battering ram they'd brought along, they strode toward the door, which was when Derek saw the shattered glass where the doors should have been. And it was dark inside. No movement either. I don't think there are docks here. Derek was surprised at the disappointment he felt. Having a working hospital would have felt so normal. 
Shrugging it off, he drew his gun and his flashlight and stepped through the glass. Chris was right behind him. Sweeping the space with the beam of light, Derek didn't see anyone, only a mess of a room. Chairs overturned, papers scattered everywhere, a hospital gown crumpled in a corner. Just gotta find the pharmacy, he softly said as he moved forward. With Chris keeping an eye on his six, Derek went down a hallway on the hunt for the main lobby. It was obvious when they reached it. Light flooded in through soaring floor-to-ceiling windows, tucking his flashlight into his pocket, and while keeping an eye out for anyone lurking about, Derek strode right to the directory. Second floor, he murmured. Slowly spinning in a circle, he spotted the stairs and trotted over to them. Chris was right behind him, keeping an eye on things. Once he reached the landing, Derek flicked his flashlight back on. There was still some light from the windows, but farther down the hall, it was dark. Moving steadily forward, it didn't take long to find the pharmacy, and when he saw it was locked up, he smiled. Better chance no one had ransacked it yet. A metal sliding door was all the way down at the counter, and the door to enter the back area of the pharmacy was locked. Derek held up the battering ram as he smiled at Chris. This is exactly why I wanted to bring this. Chris grinned back. After a couple of swift slams into the door with the battering ram, the door swung inward. Derek set the battering ram on the counter, then went inside, leading with his gun and flashlight. The beam of light lit up full shelves. Shocked that the pharmacy was still so well stocked, it suddenly occurred to him that there could be people in the building that were protecting the hospital, including the pharmacy. But if there were, where were they? Somewhere else in the hospital? Or maybe they'd moved on and were no longer there? Not wanting to be there if someone came back, Derek began searching for the items Sarah had requested. Completely unfamiliar with how pharmacies were organized, it was a labor-intensive process, especially since he had to do it by flashlight. He would have asked Chris to help, but he needed him on watch. How's it going in there? Chris asked as he stepped into the room where Derek was scanning the bottles on the shelf on the hunt for amoxicillin. It's going slowly, unfortunately. Derek didn't look up when he answered. Maybe we should just take it all. Derek glanced at Chris, not sure if we could carry it all. He shifted his gaze back to the shelves as he seriously considered the idea. It would certainly be faster to take it all and let Sarah sort it out. Screw it, he muttered. Then he grabbed a box filled with papers, dumped it out on the floor, and began sweeping bottles into it. Chris chuckled and left the room. As it turned out, he and Chris really couldn't carry everything, but Derek hoped they'd at least snag many of the items on Sarah's list. As they both carried large boxes filled with medication down the stairs and toward the lobby, Derek felt a small twinge of guilt that they'd hardly left anything for anyone else. Shoving aside that concern, how many people were left alive anyway, he entered the lobby, his head on a swivel. Still empty. Good. He walked briskly toward the shattered doors and stepped through, then hustled toward the charger, where he and Chris set the boxes in the trunk and closed the lid. Don't move, a male voice commanded from right behind them. Chapter 24 Derek Derek froze. Who was this? The person guarding the hospital? Had he been watching them the entire time? Hands on your heads, the man demanded. Annoyed but not wanting to get shot, Derek laced his fingers behind his neck. Then he turned his head to size up the man who was behind him and Chris. Turned out there were two men. Derek immediately recognized their uniforms. They were state security officers, like the ones at the DMV, and both were pointing their guns at Derek and Chris's heads. Wonderful. Face front, 
the same one said. Holding back an audible sigh, Derek did as he was told. While one of the men held his gun on Derek and Chris, the other patted them down, taking both of their guns as well as their knives. Now, face down on the ground, Derek glanced over his shoulder. What for? The man stepped close to Derek and jammed his gun against Derek's head. Do it. Derek's blood began to boil, but he didn't want to get shot, so he lay on the pavement. Chris did the same. While the man who seemed to be in charge, boss man, kept his gun pointed at them, the other man went into the charger and began searching. Fury made Derek's head pound, but he stayed silent. When the man was done searching the inside of the charger, he walked over to his companion, carrying two more guns, as well as Derek and Chris's extra ammo. Awesome. Now they had no weapons. The man who had done the searching popped the trunk. What do we have here? He asked. From the ground, Derek couldn't see what the security man was doing, but he imagined he was digging through the medications they'd pilfered from the pharmacy. This will be a nice addition to our supplies, the man said as he lifted the boxes of meds out of the trunk and set them on the ground. Boss man chuckled. Indeed. Then he turned his attention back to Derek and Chris. On your feet, slowly. Wanting nothing more than to kill these guys, Derek slowly got to his feet and faced the two men. Chris stood as well. Boss man was about Derek's height and fit looking. Not only that, but his gun was pointed at Derek, while the other man was aiming his gun at Chris. Wouldn't exactly be a fair fight. What do you people want? Derek asked with barely contained fury. Boss man's lips compressed. Just doing our job. Narrowing his eyes, Derek asked, And what is that? Boss man smirked. Stop and search. On what grounds? No grounds needed. Derek's eyebrows jerked together. Since when? Since the governor decreed it. Decreed it? Disgusted at the idea, he nearly spit the question out. He's the governor, not the freaking king. Boss man laughed. Tell him that. Derek would love to have the chance, right before he shot him in the head. As they stood there, Derek had to work to keep eye contact with boss man rather than try to hide his face. Were these guys familiar with that wanted flyer, the one with his picture plastered on it? Though it would have been immensely satisfying to take these security officers out, Derek was realistic enough to know that he was at a huge disadvantage. The better option was to get away from them. Can we go? Boss man stared at Derek. You should know that the governor has instituted a dusk-to-dawn curfew. Why? Chris asked. Boss man shifted his gaze to Chris, but Derek noticed the other security officer staring at him, studying Derek's face with narrowed eyes. That couldn't be good. Apparently there was some trouble north of here, at the DMV. Boss man frowned. Derek tried not to chuckle at that, schooling his expression under the scrutiny of boss man's sidekick. What kind of trouble? Chris asked with a straight face that impressed Derek. Boss man's frown deepened. The kind that involves killing innocent people. Derek couldn't stop his eyebrows from shooting up. Innocent people? Like who? Because the only people he and Chris had killed had been people just like Boss Man and his sidekick. They shot a citizen who was minding his own business before turning the guns on the security officers. Wanting to shout, that's a lie, Derek clamped his mouth shut. That's despicable, Chris said. Then he glanced at the guns the men had taken off of him and Derek. We need to get going. Can we have our guns? I mean, we need to protect ourselves against those kinds of people. Boss man shook his head. No one's allowed to have guns but trained security officers. He paused. We'll keep the people safe. Derek couldn't believe boss man said that with a straight face. How many security officers are there? 
Derek asked the question, as if he thought the state security officers really could protect the citizenry. In reality, he needed to know how many to watch out for. Not sure, boss man said. He glanced at their car. You can go. Stay out of trouble. Derek was about to protest that the security officers had taken their medicine when Sidekick said, Wait! Boss man looked at the man. What? Sidekick pointed his gun at Derek. Turn around and put your hands on your head. What's up? Boss man asked Sidekick. Derek stayed where he was. He didn't want to turn his back on these men. He's one of them, Sidekick said. From the wanted poster. Boss man's gaze jerked to Derek, his eyes narrowing as he looked him over. That true? You wanted? Feeling like he was in an old western, Derek shook his head. No, sir. Boss man glanced at Sidekick, then faced Derek again. Turn around. Evidently, he believed his buddy over Derek. His mind whirling with what to do, Derek slowly began to turn. The sound of a gunshot shattered the air as a bullet pinged to the ground at Derek's feet. What the hell? Had boss man been ordered to shoot him on sight? Not waiting to see, Derek dove for the pavement, scrambling to get around the charger and out of boss man's line of fire. That's when he heard another gunshot and then a grunt. Glancing over his shoulder to see if Chris was hit, Derek was confused when he saw Sidekick lying on the ground with a pool of blood spreading out around him. Derek's gaze went to boss man. He was aiming his gun at the hospital while pulling the trigger. Chris was right behind Derek, unharmed. Half a second later, understanding dawned. Whoever had been guarding the hospital was shooting at them, had actually hit sidekick. Derek met Chris's eyes, then he gestured with his head to go. Chris nodded, and the two of them stayed low as they moved away from the charger, away from the gunfight. There weren't a lot of cars in the parking lot, but they managed to not get shot as they put distance between themselves and the gun battle. When they were a relatively safe distance away, Derek hunkered down beside a car and looked back toward Boss Man. He'd taken cover behind the charger and was still shooting toward a broken window from which gunshots occasionally came. What about the meds? Chris asked from beside Derek. Derek shook his head. We can come back for them later. Assuming whoever was in the hospital didn't take them back. Chapter 25 Derek Keeping an eye on the action, Derek, with Chris by his side, worked his way away from the hospital. They'd gone a hundred yards when the gunfire abruptly ceased. Derek stopped and looked at Chris, then spun all the way around and looked toward Boss Man. Boss Man was too far away for Derek to see clearly, but it looked like he was lying on the ground beside the charger rather than crouching. Was he dead? Derek lifted his gaze to the window of the hospital where the shots had been coming from. No one was visible, but again, it was quite a distance away. Too bad his binox were in his pack, which was in the car. What do you think? Chris asked. Get the car and the meds? That would be nice, considering that was the whole point of coming to the hospital. The likelihood of finding another well-stocked pharmacy seemed pretty slim. Still, Derek didn't want to get shot. But always up for a challenge, he smiled at Chris. Yeah. Chris grinned before they started making their way back to the charger, careful to stay behind cover where possible. When they were about 30 feet from the charger, they paused. Derek's eyes went to boss man. Yup, looked dead. Derek raised his gaze to the broken hospital window. Still no movement. Did someone have Derek and Chris in their sights right that second? Maybe from another window. Scanning all the windows, Derek watched for movement. Nothing. Slightly nervous, but determined to complete the mission they'd set out on, Derek looked at Chris, 
and nodded. Going from car to car, they worked their way back to the charger. When they reached it, Derek immediately saw a problem. The charger had been shot up pretty good, and two of the tires were flat. They wouldn't be taking it anywhere. Derek checked boss man, while Chris checked sidekick. Both were dead. Derek grabbed the gun that the men had taken from him and dropped the magazine. Empty. He and Chris checked all the guns. All empty. Looked like boss man had used up every bullet they had with them, even used the spare clips. Shaking his head in annoyance, when no one shot at them, Derek began to hope whoever was inside was either dead or out of ammo. Now what? Chris asked as he crouched beside the charger. Squatting next to him, Derek frowned. Where's the car these idiots drove? Chris rose a bit as he glanced around. No idea. Carefully peering over the charger, Derek scanned the area, but didn't see any cars that screamed government. Keeping an eye on the hospital, maybe whoever had killed the security officers was getting more ammo, Derek went to boss man and dug through his pockets. No keys. He checked sidekick as well. Nothing. Must have left them in their car, he muttered as he went back to Chris. Debating whether to search for the men's car, which would put them in range of the sniper in the hospital, or figure something else out, Derek sighed. You wearing comfortable shoes? Chris chuckled. Always. With a nod, Derek opened the rear passenger door of the charger, then grabbed his pack, as well as Chris's, from the back seat. He handed Chris his pack, then shrugged on his own. Next, he put the boxes of meds back in the trunk for safekeeping, before turning to Chris. Ready? Yep. Keeping low, Derek and Chris moved as quickly as they could away from the hospital. Once Derek thought they were out of range of the sniper, who had yet to shoot at them, he began to relax. How far to the farm, do you think? Chris pursed his lips. Maybe ten miles? That wasn't too bad. If they moved quickly, they could be back at the farm in a couple of hours. Derek nodded. Okay, let's hit it. They started walking at a brisk pace. The hospital was nestled in a community, so as they walked, they passed through neighborhoods. As they came to one house, they saw a man working in a front yard garden, kneeling in the dirt, pulling weeds. It was the same man they'd passed when they'd driven to the hospital earlier. The man didn't seem to notice their approach. Wanting to let the man know they were there and that they weren't a threat, Derek called out, Hello! The man's head jerked up, and his hand went to the gun on his hip. Derek threw his hands up to show he was unarmed. Chris lifted his hands as well. The man slowly moved his hand away from his gun. Howdy! Deciding to take a moment to see if the man had any useful information to share, Derek slowed. Nice garden. Smiling, the man stood. Thanks. It's a lot of work. Chuckling, Derek nodded. Tell me about it. The man tilted his head. You a gardener? I'm new to it, but yeah. A wry smile tilted the man's lips. Kind of a necessary skill nowadays. Derek laughed. That's for sure. After pausing a beat, Derek said, You run into any government types lately? A deep frown tugged the man's mouth downward. Yeah. Clearly, this man hadn't had a great interaction with the government. If you don't mind me asking, what happened? The man walked closer to Derek and Chris, although he stopped about eight feet away from them. I was minding my own business, working in my yard, when these two guys pulled up in a car. I thought, okay, who are these guys? What do they want? Are they here to cause trouble? But they acted all friendly at first. Caught up in the man's story, Derek listened intently. Then they started asking all kinds of questions. How many people lived in my house? Did we have food? What about guns? Derek nodded. Sounded like just what had happened at the farm. I told him it was none of his damn business. The man's eyebrows rose. Guess he didn't like that answer. 
One of the guys reached toward his gun, but his partner shook his head, so the guy stopped. The man glanced at his garden. Good thing I don't need help from the government. If I did, I would be in trouble, because from what I've heard, they won't help unless I do something first. Like, give up my guns. He shook his head as he grimaced. That's something I'll never do. Not willingly. Derek liked this guy and was glad he'd stopped to chat with him. It was reassuring to know there were other people who felt the same way he did. The man shook his head. These government guys have let their power go to their head. No one to stop them now. No one but us, Derek murmured. The man nodded. Exactly. He paused. I've heard rumors that some guys killed a few government security people. Derek's heart lurched. Circulating rumors weren't what he'd been after when he'd taken out the security men. Still, he wanted to counteract the incorrect information with the truth. We heard that an innocent citizen was running with some food and got shot in the back by the state guys. The man looked at them in surprise and horror. Really? Derek nodded. Yeah. The man shook his head. Time to move on. Good luck with your garden, Derek said. Then he glanced at Chris, who evidently got the message that it was time to go because he nodded. Good luck to you, the man said. But he didn't turn his back on Derek and Chris as they walked away. When they'd gone far enough that the man couldn't overhear them, Derek said, How many other people feel like we do about the government taking our guns? Most people, probably. Wouldn't surprise me if the people we saw at the DMV were only there because they were desperate. Chris nodded. Yeah, although some people probably like the idea of the government taking care of them. Derek snorted a laugh. Just like before. He'd never understood that mindset. He was all about being self-sufficient. Now, in the apocalypse, he'd discovered just how much he liked living off the grid. Rather than going to a job every morning, he spent his day working in the garden or scavenging for what his group needed that they weren't able to create for themselves. It definitely wasn't easy, but every single thing they had, they had made happen themselves. It gave him a strong sense of accomplishment, one he'd never felt in his before life. Deep in thought, when Derek felt the pain of something slamming against his skull, all he could do as he began to lose consciousness was berate himself for not having better situational awareness. Chapter 26 Matt Matt glanced at the sun. It was mid-afternoon. Derek and Chris had been gone all day. Think they'll be back soon? Amy, Chris's wife, asked him. He stood from the dirt where he'd been weeding the garden and faced her. Worry creased her forehead. Any minute now, I'll bet. A tentative smile lifted her lips, but he could tell she was desperately hanging on to hope. Did Jessica feel like that every time he went out? He remembered how worried he'd been when she'd gone with Derek, and then when she'd been kidnapped... He didn't want to think about that. Anyway, this wasn't Jessica. This was Chris and Derek. They'd be fine. They had skills. They could handle anything. Mommy, Jacob, Amy's six-year-old son, said as he yanked on her T-shirt. I'm hungry, Matt frowned. It had to be so difficult to have small children in this new world where you couldn't just run to the local McDonald's and grab a Happy Meal. The only Happy Meal nowadays was the one that filled your belly. Their group was fortunate to have an abundance of food. Okay, maybe not an abundance, but they were getting by pretty well. With all the food they'd scavenged and the growing garden, they would be fine. He hoped. Okay, baby, Amy said to Jacob. Let's go help Sarah. Matt watched her go as an increasing sense of concern crept over him. Derek and Chris should have been back by then. If their run was going to take this long, they would have tried to check in. As dinner time approached, 
Matt was on watch along with Emily. Jeff was positioned in the sniper's nest that they kept manned. With Cleo, Brooks' German shepherd, by his side, Matt walked the perimeter of the front yard. Cleo looked toward the gate and barked, her tail wagging. Matt's gaze shot in that direction. He hadn't heard a vehicle approach. Was someone on foot? He glanced at Cleo. She acted like it was someone she knew. Then she took off, racing toward the gate, her tail swinging from side to side. On high alert, Matt moved toward the gate as fast as he could. Cleo stopped beside the gate. Matt caught up to her, his gun in the low ready position. Staying beside a tree, out of sight of whoever might be there, he poked his head around the trunk. That's when he saw Chris, on foot and alone. Chris was disheveled, his expression strained. Chris, Matt said as he unlocked the gate. He pulled it open wide enough for Chris to walk through. Where's Derek? Chris shook his head. Matt's heart plummeted into his stomach. Is he dead? I don't know. Chris's voice broadcast exhaustion. What had happened? Chris sighed. Let's get everyone together so I only have to tell this story once. Ten minutes later, everyone was sitting in the covered patio area, gathered around Chris. Even those on watch had joined them. If Derek was missing, they all wanted to know why. First, Chris told them about their experience getting the medication, including that they'd been approached by a pair of security officers who had been killed by someone in the hospital. We stopped and talked to a man working in his front yard garden, but then we went on. About ten minutes later, someone hit me over the head, and I went down. When I woke up, I was on the sidewalk, and Derek was gone. Matt tried to imagine how he would have felt if he'd been in Chris's shoes. At the thought, his stomach clenched. And where was Derek? Was he hurt? Had to be. Otherwise, he would have gotten away. After I shook off my lightheadedness, Chris said, I noticed a note duct taped to my shirt. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a crumpled sheet of paper. He handed it to Matt, who was sitting closest to him. Matt skimmed over the note, his heart lurching more with every word. Then he read it out loud. Bring two large boxes of food and five gallons of clean water to the address below. Have it there by eight tonight, or we'll kill your friend. Grimacing, Matt met the faces of the others, many who were wide-eyed. Low-life scumbags, Jeff muttered. We have to get Derek back. Paisley said, as she pinched the skin at her throat. Matt nodded, surprised by the intense worry in her eyes. Of course we will, especially after all Derek had done for his family. Without him, would they even all still be alive? Let's get the food together, Jessica said as she stood. There's no time to waste. Matt was as eager as the rest of them to make sure Derek was safe, but it still angered him that Derek had been taken hostage for a ransom of food and water. He turned to Jeff. Are we going to let these guys get away with this? One side of Jeff's mouth turned up in a smirk. You have to ask? That was one of the many things he liked about Jeff. He could always count on him to not put up with anyone's crap. He chuckled. <laughs> right. Jessica stood. Sarah and some of the others stood as well. You guys make your plans, she said. We'll gather the food and water. At least they had plenty of water, but taking two large boxes of food would hurt. Fresh anger coursed through Matt as Jeff and Chris moved their chairs closer to his. How do you want to do this? Jeff silently nodded, obviously deep in thought. Then he said, here's what we'll do. Matt listened closely as Jeff laid out his plan. Chapter 27 Derek Derek's head pounded. A blindfold covered his eyes, and something covered his mouth. Felt like duct tape. He was lying on a carpeted floor with his hands and ankles bound. Where was he? 
How had he gotten there? Who had taken him? Security officers? If so, he was screwed. And where was Chris? Was he lying in the room as well? Holding perfectly still, he listened intently. With no electricity, there were very few sounds, not even the hum of a refrigerator. He could hear trees swaying in the wind outside. Then he heard voices coming from a nearby room. He strained to make out what they were saying. It'll work, a man with a deep voice said. It did before. What if his friend doesn't follow orders? Another man asked. Then we kill him, deep voice said. Derek tried to put together the puzzle that had formed in his mind, but there were too many missing pieces. Although from what these men were saying, Derek didn't think they were security officers. That was the only bit of good news, though. Lying on the ground, bound and blinded, he felt helpless, which only made his anger grow. If he could somehow get free. He wiggled his arms, which were behind his back, to test whatever was binding his wrists. It felt like they'd used duct tape. That was bad, unless there was something sharp he could rub them against. Lying on his back, he bent his knees and placed his feet flat on the floor, then pushed off of the floor to move backwards, inch by inch. It was a painfully slow process, but he used his bound hands underneath him to help propel him backwards as he searched the space for some sort of object he could use to his advantage. Eventually, he bumped into a wall. Shifting his body in another direction, he moved the other way. Still nothing. The room seemed to be completely empty. Discouragement washed over him. He heard the door open, then felt the floor vibrate with heavy footsteps. You're awake, Deep Voice said. Derek didn't reply. He couldn't with his mouth covered. Instead, he held still. Maybe if they got close enough, he could... What? Kick them? Well, that was something at least. He could feel someone kneeling beside his head. No way to kick the guy. The tape was ripped from his mouth. Clenching his jaw closed to keep from crying out at the unexpected sting, Derek was thrilled to be able to speak. Maybe he could get some answers. But he would wait. Let these guys take the lead. He didn't want to give anything away. It sounded like the man stood. No one spoke for at least 30 seconds. No questions, huh? Deep Voice asked. Did that bother them? They'd said they'd done this before. How many times? What exactly had they done? How had their other victims reacted? Probably with fear and begging. That wasn't the way Derek operated. A man sighed. Derek held back a grin. His silence was getting to them. Maybe he's a mute, the other man said. No, Deep Voice said. He just thinks he's a tough guy. A boot slammed into Derek's gut. He couldn't help it. He cried out. The kick had been unexpected, had caught him off guard, and it hurt like crazy. To protect himself from further blows, he drew his legs closer to his chest. Not so tough now, are you? Deep Voice said with a chuckle. Eager to get his hands on these guys, Derek let rage soak into him. The adrenaline rush that followed helped to mask the pain. Got something to say? Deep Voice asked. Reminding himself to unclench his jaw, Derek said, Whatever your plans are, they're going to fail. There was a brief moment of silence. Then Deep Voice laughed. The other man chuckled more softly. Knowing that his friends would come for him, Derek just smiled. Chapter 28 Matt It was six o'clock, two hours until their deadline. They'd loaded the boxes of food and water into Matt's truck, and now Matt, Jeff, and Chris were ready to head out. Jessica and Emily had wanted to come with them, but Matt and the others had convinced them to stay at the farm to help keep it safe. Now, as they were about to leave, Matt embraced Jessica. 
please be careful, she murmured. You don't know who you're dealing with. Matt nodded. He understood her worry. If these guys had managed to capture Derek, they had to have some level of skill, and Matt had no idea how dangerous they were, or how many there were. Matt kissed her, then smiled. You know we'll be careful. She gave him a final hug, then stepped back so that he could get in his truck. Jeff and Chris were telling their loved ones goodbye. Then they got in the truck as well. All three of them were well-armed and carrying extra ammo. Frank stood beside the open gate, which Matt drove through. With Chris directing him, Matt headed to the place where Chris and Derek had been attacked. Matt pulled to the curb at the spot Chris pointed out. Matt scanned the area for any hint of where Derek might be, but the silent houses gave nothing away. Let's talk to the man who was working in his front yard garden, Matt said. Maybe he saw something. Good idea, Chris said. His house isn't far. A few minutes later, the three of them stopped on the sidewalk in front of the man's house. Hello, Chris called out. My friend and I spoke to you earlier. Can I talk to you for a minute? The door opened a crack. What do you want? Chris stepped forward, while Matt and Jeff stayed on the sidewalk. My friend from earlier? He's missing. We were attacked not far from here. Chris swept his arm in the direction they'd just come from, then turned back to the man. Someone took him. Did you see or hear anything earlier? After we walked away? The door opened wider, and the man stepped onto his porch. He shook his head. No, I didn't see anything. What about a car or truck driving by? The man shook his head. Nope. Sorry. Did you hear anything? No. Matt wondered if the man was telling the truth, or if he really knew something but was too scared to tell. Matt kind of wanted to shove the man out of the way and search his house, but he restrained himself. Mind if we take a look inside? Jeff asked, evidently not willing to restrain himself at all. Matt softly chuckled. The man lifted his gaze to Jeff. What? Chris turned and looked at Jeff, then shifted his eyes to Matt. Matt lifted his eyebrows, hoping Chris got the message. See if he'll let you take a look. Chris turned back to the man at the door. We don't mean to intrude, but it would set our minds at ease if we could just, you know, make sure Derek's not inside. The man frowned as he stared at Chris for several beats. Finally, he nodded. Fine, just make it quick. His gaze flicked to Matt and Jeff before going back to Chris. Just you. Chris nodded, then stepped inside. The man closed the front door behind him. Feeling a little nervous, if this man was part of a dangerous group, Chris was now in peril. Matt shifted from one foot to the other. Relax, Jeff said. Chris can handle himself. Matt nodded. A minute later, the front door opened and Chris appeared. Again, he said to the man. Sorry to intrude. Good luck finding your friend. Chris nodded and trotted down the walkway to meet up with Matt and Jeff. The man closed his front door. He's not in there, Chris said. Let's swing by the hospital and pick up those meds, Jeff said, and then we'll head to the drop-off. They all agreed. They were able to grab the meds from the charger's trunk at the nearby hospital without incident, and then they headed to the address where the note had said to drop off the food, a local park. They slowly drove by. No one was around. Not a single person. We need to stake it out, Jeff said. Matt nodded. Yeah. First, they stopped the truck and carried the food and water to a nearby park bench where they set the boxes underneath. After they got back in the truck, they drove half a mile further on, parking in the driveway of a house with a large red X painted on its front door. Putting on their tactical gear, they made sure they had plenty of ammo before briskly walking back toward the park. When the park was in sight, they slowed, and when they reached it, they split up. Matt circled the edge of the park, on the hunt for a good place to hunker down and wait. When he reached a playground, 
He quickly scoped it out before climbing into a small fort that had a good view of the park bench where they'd dropped off the food and water. He lay on his belly, then picked up the walkie-talkie he'd brought and pressed the button twice. A single squawk sounded in reply. They were ready. Chapter 29 Matt Someone's coming, Matt heard Jeff say over the walkie. To the east. They'd been waiting for well over an hour, but it wasn't yet the eight o'clock deadline. Matt squinted in the direction Jeff had indicated. It was a little difficult to see as the sun was setting, but then he saw that someone was indeed coming. It looked like a woman, pushing a stroller. Doubtful it was the person they were waiting for, the person who had taken Derek. Matt frowned. The woman walked slowly, casually, as if she was simply out for a stroll in the beautiful spring evening, taking her child out to get some fresh air. But she was walking in the direction of the park bench. Would she see the boxes, even in the dimming light? Concerned she would interfere with their mission, Matt watched her closely. Before long, she reached the park bench. From his vantage point, Matt could see her turn as if she was looking at the boxes. Then she swiveled her head the other way, as if to make sure no one was watching her. After a moment's hesitation, she knelt beside the park bench, then reached out and grabbed one of the boxes, dragging it from underneath the bench. Should we stop her? Chris asked over the walkie. Wait, Jeff replied immediately. Growing more anxious by the second, Matt stayed hidden as he watched. She opened the box and dug through it. She pulled out the other box and checked it, then stood and looked around again. Great, she was going to take the food meant for Derek's ransom. But how was she going to haul it away with a child in the stroller? Then, to Matt's surprise, she picked up the first box and set it right in the stroller. She was going to crush her child. Then he knew. There was no child in there. She was the pickup person for the ransom. She loaded the other box into the stroller as well as the water, tossed a blanket over everything, then turned and began walking briskly back the way she'd come. Matt picked up his walkie. We need to follow her. Affirmative, Jeff replied. Rendezvous at the eastern edge of the park. Moments later, the three of them stood together. The woman was still visible, though she was rapidly disappearing down the street, and twilight was coming on fast. Peering around a large bush, Matt watched as the woman approached a corner. When she turned and began heading down the adjacent street, Matt, Jeff, and Chris set a fast pace as they walked after her. At the corner where she'd turned, they crept up to a house that would block them from view edging around it until they could see the woman without being seen themselves. The woman paused, looking behind her before scanning in all directions. She crossed the street, looked around once again, then went up the driveway of a blue house and opened the front door. A moment later, she was gone. Gotcha, Jeff muttered. Matt smiled. Derek was near, they would be able to save him and get their food back. We'll wait until it's completely dark, Jeff said. About 20 minutes. Once it was sufficiently dark, they made their move, being stealthy as they eased along the opposite side of the street from the blue house. They went one house beyond the blue house before crossing the street and doubling back toward it. Jeff signaled that he would go around back, then he motioned for Chris and Matt to enter through the front door. Adrenaline surged through Matt. They had zero idea who was inside the house with the woman. Whoever had taken Derek was skilled enough to sneak up on Derek and Chris, so they would need to be ready for anything. Inhaling sharply before slowly releasing his breath, Matt pressed his back to the side of the front door before nodding at Chris. Chris quietly twisted the doorknob. Not surprisingly, it was locked. Chris frowned in Matt's direction. Matt lifted his shoulders in a shrug. There was no quiet way to do this. Chris took a step back, 
and then aimed his gun at the locking mechanism. A blast shattered the silent night as the door swung inward and a woman screamed. Hands in the air, Chris barked. Now! Candles lit the interior, allowing Matt to see the woman huddling in the corner of a couch. No one was with her. Who else is here? Matt shouted as Chris dashed to the sliding glass door to let Jeff inside. Eyes wide with terror, the woman shook her head. It's just me. Matt didn't believe her. He kept his gun pointed at her as Jeff and Chris disappeared down the hall. A couple of minutes later, the pair walked back into the front room where Matt and the woman were. With hope filling his chest, Matt looked from Jeff to Chris. They both shook their heads. He's not here, Jeff said. Maybe they had it all wrong. Maybe this woman had nothing to do with Derek's disappearance. We found this in an empty room, Chris said, holding up a piece of duct tape that was nearly a foot long. Narrowing his eyes, Matt turned back to the woman. Where is he? Her eyes were wide. Who? Impatience sliced through him. He took three long strides to reach her, his gun leading the way. She shrank back. Guilt washed over him. Until she spoke. They, they took him somewhere. So, she was part of the kidnapping scheme. Where? Jeff demanded in his booming voice. The woman shifted her gaze to him. I, I'm not sure. Then her eyes widened. You're, you're one of them. Jeff recoiled. One of who? The woman pointed to a sheet of paper on a long, low table that sat below a useless television. Matt was standing closest to it, so he crossed the short distance and snatched the paper from the table. He sighed and shook his head before holding the paper up for Jeff and Chris to see. It's the wanted flyer. He held it where the woman could see it, pointing to the picture of Derek. Is this who they took? The woman bit her lip, then nodded. Where did they take him? Her mouth opened. Then she slowly shook her head. I... I don't know. Without warning, Jeff strode over to the woman and pointed his gun right at her. Don't make me kill you, too. She gasped, her eyes even wider. She'd seen the wanted poster, so she had to know that Jeff had killed already. She had to be terrified. Matt felt kind of bad for her. But he shoved down those feelings. They needed to find Derek before something happened to him. The woman trembled as she stared up at Jeff. They were going to... to turn him in for the... the reward. Where? Jeff asked. Exactly. Matt could see her swallowing hard. When she hesitated, Jeff took a menacing step toward her. She threw her hands up. Wait! He stopped keeping his gun pointed at her. The woman visibly swallowed. They were going to go to Sacramento, to the governor's residence, to make a deal, a big deal, for lots of food and supplies. When did they leave? Matt asked. Three hours ago? What's the address? With a trembling finger, she pointed to a notepad on the corner of the table. Matt snatched it up, and when he saw an address written out, he tore the sheet of paper from the pad and tucked it into his pocket. He looked at Jeff and Chris. We've got to go. Now. Jeff holstered his gun, then looked at Matt. Watch her. He turned to Chris. Come with me. The two of them left the room. A few moments later, they returned with the boxes of food in their arms. Let's go, Jeff said. Matt turned to follow them. Wait, the woman said. All three men turned to her. Please don't take it all. We, we don't have any food. Jeff made a scoffing sound. Unless your friends make a deal with the governor. At the thought of Derek being turned over to the state, Matt felt his blood turning to ice in his veins. There was no way the governor would let Derek live. And it was all the fault of this woman and her group. But I'm hungry now. The woman's voice was nearly a whine. Fury shot through Matt. He glared at the woman. 
You not only helped kidnap our friend, you were going to be a party to his murder if we didn't do what you said. And now, you've pretty much guaranteed him a death sentence. He fumed. You should be grateful we're letting you live. At that, he turned and strode toward the front door. Jeff and Chris followed him out. Chapter 30 Derek The hard surface in the trunk of the car he was riding in made Derek squirm in discomfort. That and the small space that forced him to draw his knees nearly up to his chest. Every bump and pothole these idiots drove over made him bounce, causing him to wince. How far were they going? It seemed as if they'd been traveling for well over an hour. Too bad his arms were behind his back, or he might have been able to disengage the emergency release on the trunk. Then he thought about his friends. He was confident that they were searching for him, but how would they find him? He thought about the conversation he'd overheard between Deep Voice and his buddy. They'd said something about following orders, like they'd told Chris to do something in exchange for Derek's life. What was it? Had Chris done it? Where were they taking him now? Earlier, after he'd refused to beg, like Deep Voice had clearly wanted him to do, Derek had been relieved when the two men had left him alone, at least for a while. When they'd come back into the room, they'd roughly carried him out of the house, still bound ankle and wrist, as well as blindfolded, and tossed him in the trunk of the car he was now riding in. Maybe they were taking him to a rendezvous point, one where he would be set free if Chris had followed whatever orders they'd given him. All Derek knew was that the moment he had his chance, he would kill these guys. It all hinged on getting that chance, though, and so far he hadn't had much of a chance. Not with the way they'd kept him trussed up. The car began to slow. What was going to happen now? Holding completely still, he listened intently. With the car's engine off, he could hear the men talking in low voices through the seat that separated the trunk from the interior of the car. You stay with him while I check things out. That was deep voice talking. Was he going to see if Chris had done what they'd told him to do? Perhaps Derek's freedom was moments away. Hope surged through him. The sound of a car door opening and closing, then footsteps walking away. Distinctly uncomfortable, Derek longed to get out of the trunk. Hey, Derek called out. I gotta take a piss. The sound of another door opening, footsteps approaching, then the trunk lock disengaging. Fresh air poured in. Inhaling greedily, Derek forced himself to note whatever he could. The air was cool, like it was at night. Okay, it was past dusk. Shut up back here, the second in command said. Why? Were there people around who could hear him? Let me out of here. I gotta pee. Too bad, the jerk said. You're not coming out of there. Not now, anyway. With deep voice gone who knew where, Derek decided it was time to do a little talking. Where are we? The man sighed. Don't worry about it. Right. Look, if you and your friend need food, I can get some for you. Just let me go. The man laughed. So... You're saying if we let you go, you'll get food and bring it to us willingly. How stupid do you think we are? Derek didn't answer that. No reason to antagonize the man. Of course I will. I'm a man of my word. At least with honorable people, which these guys definitely were not. No. Now shut up. The trunk slammed closed. Frustrated beyond measure, Derek kicked the inside of the trunk in hopes of getting someone's attention. Unfortunately, it only annoyed his captor, who flung the trunk open and smashed him in the head with his gun. Derek blacked out. When he came to, he heard talking. Deep voice had returned. When Derek heard him say, It's all arranged, his heart began to pound. Somehow he didn't think his freedom was imminent. 
The car started up, and they lurched forward. A few minutes later, it came to a halt. Several voices could be heard now. The car doors opened and closed. The trunk popped open. Adrenaline dumped into Derek's veins. Here he is, deep voice said. Delivered as promised. Through his blindfold, Derek could tell someone was shining a bright light at his face. Yep, a new voice said. Looks like him. A pause. Get him out of there. Then you can collect your reward. Oh, crap. Deep Voice and his buddy had turned him in to the government. Chapter 31 Matt Matt, Jeff, and Chris went back to the farm and told everyone what had happened. We're going after Derek, Matt announced, as his eyes swept over the assembled group. I'm going with you, Jessica announced. His gaze shot to her. He didn't want her anywhere near danger, but at the look in her eyes, he knew she wouldn't be moved. Derek came for me when those men grabbed me, she added to show that she had a very good reason to go. I want to do the same for him. Matt understood. Besides, she was proving to him every day that she could handle herself. Okay. A broad smile lit her face. Twenty minutes later, Matt, Jessica, Jeff, and Chris were ready to go. They'd packed more firepower and ammo, and as they were loading Chris's SUV, Brooke ran up with Cleo on her heels. Do you want to take Cleo? she asked. Matt looked at the others, but before he could answer, Jessica answered with an enthusiastic, Yes! Would Cleo be a help or a hindrance on this mission? If Cleo had been with us when those men showed up, Jessica said, as if she'd read the question on his mind, I don't think they would have taken me. I mean, I would have kept her with me. She would have protected me, or at least warned me that the men were there. Matt couldn't argue with her logic. He glanced at Jeff and Chris, who were slowly nodding. Smiling, he said, Guess Cleo's coming. Thank you, Brooke, Jessica said. Brooke beamed. She'll be glad to go on an adventure. Matt just hoped it would be an adventure that would have a happy ending. Paisley came out of the house, her expression tight. She didn't say anything, but her body language said it all. She was desperately worried about Derek. They loaded into Chris's SUV, including Brooke's German Shepherd. Chris got behind the wheel, and they headed out. Determined to find Derek and get him back before anything happened to him, they jumped on I-5 and headed north to Sacramento, which was an hour north. They didn't think they'd overtake Derek's captors, so instead they pinned their hopes on reaching the governor's residence before Derek was turned over to the man who was behind the gun confiscation scheme. As they drew closer to the governor's residence, Matt felt himself amping up. They had no idea what they'd be facing, and with Jessica in just as much danger as the rest of them, it only made things worse. She sat in the back seat with Matt. Jeff sat in the passenger seat, and Cleo was in the cargo area behind Matt and Jessica. Matt turned his head to look at Jessica, but she was staring out her window, oblivious to Matt's concerns, or maybe not oblivious, because she suddenly turned his way. A smile tugged up the corners of her lips, but it didn't last. You doing okay? He asked quietly as he placed his hand over hers. She nodded. Yeah, just anxious to get Derek back. We're getting close. Jeff said. Cut the lights. Chris complied, and a short time later, he said, There it is. Matt's gaze shot to a large house in the distance. The only lights in the area came from that house. Obviously, they had a generator or some other form of electricity. At least it made the house easier to see. Are you sure this is where they took him? Jessica asked. That's what the woman said, Matt said. Do you think she was telling the truth? He thought back to how scared she'd been. Yeah, I believe her. Jessica nodded. Okay, good. Don't get too close, Jeff said to Chris, who pulled to the curb quite a distance away. 
All four of them pulled out their binoculars. Matt first glassed the area around them, but without street lamps, it was hard to see much of anything. He turned his binox to the governor's house, leaning forward between the driver and passenger seats. A pair of armed men were patrolling the area in front of the place. I see two, Matt murmured. Agreed, Chris said. Derek's probably inside, Jeff said. Most likely, Matt said. The men who took him had a big head start, after all. I'd like to get a closer look, Jeff said. Then he added, what we need is a distraction. Seconds later, Jessica said, leave that to me. Matt yanked the binox from his eyes and turned to her. What? She was grinning. She glanced at Cleo in the back of the SUV before facing Matt. I have an idea. Then she explained what she had in mind. As she spoke, Matt felt his initial panic receding. It didn't sound dangerous after all. He nodded. Okay. Chapter 32 Derek The blindfold was removed from Derek's eyes. Squeezing his eyes closed against the bright light, they had electricity, just like he'd suspected. Derek focused on the sounds around him. Feet shuffled, the legs of a chair scraped against a wood floor. Then he was shoved backward, landing in the seat of a chair. Earlier, the duct tape around his wrists had been removed, and handcuffs had been placed there instead, although they'd let him keep his hands in front of him. The tape around his ankles had been exchanged for leg shackles. Blinking several times as his eyes adjusted to the light, Derek let his gaze sweep the space he was in. In front of him was a large desk. Behind it stood floor-to-ceiling wood shelves filled with books. He was in some sort of office. No one sat across from him, but he could feel people behind him. Turning his head to the right and then to the left, Derek used his peripheral vision to see at least two armed men arrayed behind him. Where was he, exactly? The governor's mansion? An office building? No, the room was too warm and inviting for that. Maybe it was a home office. Didn't really matter, though, did it? He was being held against his will by the people he'd been trying to avoid the most. Footsteps approached, and a man came into view. Shorter than average, with a full head of dark brown hair, the man wore a suit and tie as if the world was as normal as ever. Was this Governor Moffat? He didn't look nearly as imposing as Derek had thought he would. Ignoring Derek, the man pulled out the chair behind the desk and settled into it. He took a sip of something from a mug, glanced at a sheet of paper on his desk, and only then did he lift his eyes to Derek's face. So, the man said, his voice oozing confidence. You're the man everyone's been talking about. What have they been saying? Derek wanted to ask but he kept his lips pressed together. The man stared at him, clearly expecting Derek to say something. Derek remained stubbornly silent. What could he say? That he had to kill those men because they were going to kill him and Jeff. That he'd killed the security officers because they'd shot an innocent civilian in the back. He doubted this man would care. Then again, maybe he shouldn't assume anything. Maybe he should plead his case but he wasn't about to admit he'd killed anyone. Maybe we should introduce ourselves, the man said. A wide politician's smile curved his lips. I'm Governor Moffat, and you are? So, he was right. He ignored Moffat's question. Why am I here? He asked instead, his eyebrows squishing together in pretended confusion. Moffat's eyebrows shot up. Really? You're going to play the innocent act? I haven't done anything wrong, Derek said. Moffat lifted his gaze from Derek, sweeping it across the others in the room. Spoken like a true criminal, he shifted his eyes back to Derek. That's what you are, a criminal. How do you figure? Moffat made a scoffing sound. Murderers are criminals. Joe, 
Moffat paused. That is the name you gave, isn't it? Joe Citizen? Suppressing a smile, Derek shook his head. No idea what you're talking about. Moffat stared at him. Uh-huh. After a moment, he asked, What's your name? Derek stared back. After several moments of silence, he felt something hard press into the back of his head. A gun. Answer the governor, a man said from behind him. Derek craned his neck around, but couldn't see the man. He swiveled his head back to the front. A moment later, Derek's head jerked forward as the man shoved the gun harder against his head. Talk, the man's voice was nearly a growl. What was the governor going to do to him? Derek wasn't sure, although if he had to guess, he imagined whatever it was would end in death. Only Derek wanted the death to be the governor's, not his own. Regardless, he didn't want to put his friends at the farm in any danger, so he had to make something up. Thinking quickly, he said, Webb, Tony Webb. That was the name of the man who had tried to bring the neighborhood in Utah together, but he'd been killed for his efforts. The governor grunted. Then he called out, Ed! A moment later, footsteps approached, and a man who looked more like an aide than a security man came into view. Sir? Tony Webb. The man nodded, then turned and walked away. Derek figured the man was going to look up Tony Webb in their database. Good luck with that. Besides the fact that Derek had given them an alias, whatever Matt had done to their database a few days earlier would keep them from discovering anything useful. Hopefully. Where's your buddy? Moffat asked. John Doe? Derek shook his head. Who? Moffat narrowed his eyes. Then he snapped his fingers. A moment later, someone handed him a pair of photos. Moffat held them up. The pictures were startlingly clear, and there was no doubt that it was Derek and Jeff. Look familiar? Moffat asked with a smirk. That's me, Derek said, his voice calm. And it looks like... He let his words trail off like he was trying to figure out where they'd been taken. Oh, that's the DMV, right? Where I tried to turn in my gun. Moffat set the pictures on his desk as he slowly shook his head. You sticking to that story? It's true. Still calm, still reasonable. What happened that day? Shouldn't some law enforcement person be asking these questions? Derek tilted his head. If this is an interrogation, I'd like a lawyer. Laughter burst from everyone in the room, including Moffat. When his laughter died down, and while wearing a wide grin, he said, That's cute. He looked at someone somewhere behind Derek. He thinks he has rights. A chuckle sounded from one of the men. Just as Derek had thought, due process was no more, and Moffat was basically a dictator. The sound of rapidly approaching footsteps reached Derek's ears. Moffat looked toward the doorway. What's wrong? It's, uh... It's the database. The IT guy says it's FUBAR. Derek struggled to hold back a chuckle of his own. Moffat squinted in the man's direction. FUBAR? What are you talking about, Ed? You know, effed up beyond all recognition. Moffat sighed audibly. I know what FUBAR means. Why is it in that state? He doesn't know. He said it's been that way for a couple of days, but... He didn't want to say anything because he thought he could fix it. A pause. Guess he can't. Thank you, Matt. Biting the inside of his cheek to keep from giving away his joy, Derek stared at his cuffed hands in his lap. When Moffat was silent, Derek lifted his gaze to the man's face, which had gone beet red with fury. Good. Aren't there backups? Moffat asked through clenched teeth. Yeah, the man behind Derek stammered. IT says when he tried to load those, they got messed up too. This was too perfect. Moffat's nostrils flared. I'll deal with IT later. 
His gaze swung back to Derek, which made Derek's heart skip a beat. Perfect. He's pissed, and now he's going to deal with me. So, Tony Webb, Moffat began, his eyes flashing. Why did you kill my men? I didn't kill anyone, Derek said, while at the same time tallying up the number of people he'd killed since the apocalypse had begun. Moffat's lips twisted. Right. This wasn't going anywhere, so Derek decided to go on the offensive. Can I ask you a question? Moffat leaned back in his chair as a muscle moved in his jaw. Go ahead. His voice was calm. Evidently, the man had learned to control his anger. Who put you in charge? I mean, from what I understand, you aren't even the one the people voted in as governor. Derek squinted at him. Weren't you the treasurer or something? Moffat frowned. I was? And now you're in charge? It wasn't a question. Moffat's frown turned to a grin. I am. Derek stared at him for several beats. Why are you taking everyone's guns? Moffat tilted his head like the answer was obvious. The people of California will be safer if criminals are unarmed. Derek stared at Moffat. Did the man really believe his own propaganda? What if the criminals don't turn in their guns, but the law-abiding citizens do? Then what? A serious look came over Moffat's face. My officers will protect the citizenry. Did anyone really believe what this man was shoveling? Did the others in the room buy it? Were they that stupid? Or was Moffat just taking such good care of them that they were willing to go along with it for their own survival? Derek bet it was the latter. What gives you the right? What about the Second Amendment? A smile slowly curved Moffat's lips. Case you haven't noticed, the world's gone to crap. I'm the one in charge now, which means I can do what I want. Implement what should have been implemented in the time before. Warming to the subject, he lifted his feet from the floor and rested them on his desk, crossing one ankle over the other. Having so many people armed makes the world a more dangerous place. We can't have random people running around with guns in their hands. That causes all kinds of chaos. He paused a beat. Besides, people are starving. We're giving them life-sustaining supplies in trade for their weapons. It's a fair exchange. With every word Moffat uttered, Derek hated him more and more. If you have enough food to feed those who are starving, shouldn't you give it to them freely? A look of guilt briefly flitted across Moffat's face, but it was gone so quick that Derek couldn't have sworn he'd seen it. Moffat frowned deeply. Like I said, it's a fair exchange. If people would rather starve than give up their guns, that's their choice. Derek couldn't stop himself. Choice? I thought this was a mandatory buyback. Chuckling softly, Moffat swung his legs back to the floor. Mandatory for those who want to survive? What does that mean? Straightening, Moffat said, enough questions. He leaned forward, resting his forearms on his desk. Tell me where your friend is, and I'll go easier on you. Like a quick death instead of dragging it out? Instead of asking, Derek said, I don't have any friends. Moffat briefly closed his eyes as he shook his head. Then he opened them, and he gave one quick nod to someone behind Derek. Bam! Something slammed into Derek's skull, snapping his head to the side as stars crowded his field of vision. Damn, that hurt. Derek shook his head to clear the dizziness, then lifted his gaze to Moffat. Try again, Moffat said, his voice calm as he studied the cuticles on his right hand. Did this guy really think Derek would give up Jeff because of one little hit to the head? What an idiot. Chapter 33 Jessica Heart squeezing with fear, Jessica gripped Cleo's leash in her right hand. You're a woman walking her dog, she repeated in her mind. Nothing illegal about that. 
except for the curfew that the governor had put into place. It will be fine, she told herself. Swallowing over the anxiety that climbed her throat, she strode forward like she belonged there, although she'd never stepped foot in this neighborhood in her life. The governor's house was huge, more like a mansion, although it wasn't the historic mansion that governors of old had lived in. You, a deep male voice called out. Stop right there. Head snapping in the direction of the voice, Jessica felt her heart skip a beat. The edge of the property was less than 20 feet away, and she hadn't seen the guard approaching. She froze in place. Cleo growled. It's okay, she whispered as she placed a hand on Cleo's head to settle her. Sit, girl. Obediently, Cleo sat on her haunches. You're not supposed to be out after curfew, ma'am, the guard said as he approached her, one hand on his sidearm. In the light from the governor's lit-up house, Jessica could see the guard's eyes flick to Cleo as he stopped a good five feet away from her. Jessica glanced toward the house, on the lookout for the guards she and the others had seen through the binoculars. One was still patrolling in front of the house. At least she'd gotten the attention of this one. I just needed to take my dog for a walk, she began, so she could, you know, do her business. The guard stared at her with narrowed eyes. It's past curfew. Turn around and go home before I arrest you. Alarmed that he would arrest her, Jessica wondered if their plan would work after all. Just then, a shadow appeared behind the guard. Then the guard grunted as he began to fall. Chris stood behind the guard, helping him silently slide to the ground. Chris dragged the guard into some nearby bushes, but Jessica didn't stay to watch. Instead, she moved forward toward the second guard. He was walking away from Jessica, but when he reached the corner, he spun around and took a step in her direction. When he saw her, he paused before striding right toward her. Pretending like she belonged there, Jessica didn't make eye contact as she confidently moved forward. What are you doing? The guard asked. Then his eyes scanned the space behind her, looking for the other guard, perhaps. She needs to do her business, Jessica said, as she glanced at Cleo. The guard ignored her, evidently realizing that his companion was missing. Barely looking at Jessica, he said, Stay right there. Then he trotted off toward the area where Chris was lying in wait. Jessica turned and watched, gratified to see Chris silently slide out from the bushes and take the guard down. What's going on out here? a completely new guard said from the wide front porch. Startled, Jessica jerked her head in his direction. Where had he come from? Then she saw the front door open and yet another guard come out. Was it time to change shifts? That was bad luck on the part of Jessica and her team. Uh, she said, nervous because this was not part of the plan. Working hard not to look in the direction of the area where Chris was dragging the second guard away, Jessica focused on the guard striding down the walkway toward her. Taking my dog for a walk, the man frowned. It's after curfew. I'm sorry, she had to go, the man scowled. Where's Brighton and Teagues? The fourth guard asked the man standing in front of Jessica as he joined them on the sidewalk. This wasn't going the way they'd thought it would. Not at all. The man who had been questioning Jessica turned away from her and faced his buddy. No idea. Both men shifted their focus on Jessica, like maybe she had something to do with their co-worker's disappearance. Hands on your head, the fourth guard demanded as he withdrew his gun from his hip. Cleo growled. Shut the dog up or I'll shoot it he said as he pointed his gun at the German shepherd. Leave her alone, Jessica said, outraged by the man's threat. The man shifted his gun to Jessica, pointing it at her face. I said, hands on your head, lady. Terror shot up her spine. Would this guy actually shoot her? Not willing to test the question, and while still holding Cleo's leash, she put her hands on her head. Now, turn around. She did as she was told, wondering if Matt and Jeff were watching 
and what they could do about it. The idea was for them to be stealthy, but this was screwing everything up. Hands slid down Jessica's sides, patting her slowly and thoroughly. Cleo growled softly in her throat. The man ignored Cleo, clearly enjoying taking liberties with Jessica. Disgusted by the unnecessarily meticulous search, Jessica couldn't stop herself. She spun around and shoved the man as hard as she could. Cleo began barking wildly. Fury washed across the man's face, and he reached for Jessica. The crack of a gunshot filled Jessica's world. A second shot immediately followed. The man standing in front of her fell to the sidewalk, as did his companion. Blood pooled beneath them. Shocked, Jessica stared at the dead men. Jess, Matt called out from a short distance away. Come on! Jessica swung her head in his direction, then took off toward him with Cleo right beside her. When she reached him, she gave him a tight hug. Jeff took Cleo from Jessica, and the dog quieted. They were hidden and watched as several men poured out of the governor's house. Plan B, Jeff murmured. Chapter 34 Derek A gunshot sounded, then another. What the hell is going on? The room emptied of everyone but Derek and Moffat. Looks like it's just you and me, Moffat said, obviously believing he had the upper hand, which he did, because a moment later he reached into his desk and withdrew a gun. Don't get any ideas. Even though the governor was armed, Derek was surprised that his men had left him alone with a suspected killer. Clearly, they didn't have the training and discipline of seasoned professionals, which told Derek that they were probably recent recruits, signing up on the promise of food and other life-saving supplies. And for the power. Wanting to use this opportunity to escape, Derek tried to come up with a way to overcome the shackles on his ankles and handcuffs on his wrists, not to mention the gun the governor held in his hand, letting several scenarios play through his head, scenarios that kept ending with Derek getting shot, he asked, Do you have shootings often? Moffat smiled. Less often, now that people are turning in their guns. Soon, we won't have any more incidents. An unarmed populace is a lot easier to control, he eyed the gun, especially when those at the top have weapons. Moffat scowled. What's next? Take everyone's food? A grin replaced the scowl on Moffat's face. If necessary, for the greater good, of course. Of course. Tilting his head, Moffat stared at Derek. You don't approve. Derek's eyebrows jerked together. Hell no. You do understand that we've got to pay our security force, and money just doesn't hold the value it once did. He paused a beat. Food is the new currency. This was so reminiscent of what had happened in his neighborhood in Utah that Derek felt a sense of disquiet cascading over him. Because this wasn't a group of rogue neighbors making rules. This was the governor of an entire state. First, take everyone's weapons, creating a need for and a dependence on a state-sponsored security force. Then take the food the citizens worked hard to produce to pay that force, not to mention the lack of due process and taking away of all rights. How long have you been planning this? Moffat shrugged like it was obvious. Since it became clear that the pandemic would collapse society, a new thought came to Derek. Did the people above you in the chain of command die from the bird flu? A grin blossomed on Moffat's lips. Some of them did. So he'd killed the other people in his way. This was not the kind of man that should be running things. He was dangerous and reckless. More people would die because of him. How many people did you kill? The grin vanished. Don't you judge me, Mr. Joe Citizen. You and I both know you've killed people too. 
only to protect myself. Moffat sat back, the gun held securely in his right hand, his face relaxed. I was protecting myself. Derek shook his head. This guy was disgusting. The people of the state of California would be much better off without him. Although he had to wonder, who would take his place? Would it be someone just as bad or worse? Footsteps sounded. Sorry, sir, a man said to Moffat. Derek swiveled in his seat to see a man in a security uniform standing several feet to his right. Moffat chuckled. I was wondering when one of you would come back. He paused. What's happening out there? Uh, the man began. Moffat smiled as he glanced at Derek. Don't worry. Mr. Citizen here's not going to be around much longer. It's okay if he hears your report. Derek's heart lurched. Sounded like the governor was planning on killing him that night. The need to escape just went from a fond wish to a necessity. Okay, the man said. Someone's out there. Two of our men are dead and two are missing. It was Jeff and Chris and Matt. It had to be. Who else would try something so brazen on the very night Derek had been turned in? Squashing the smile that pushed hard against the corners of his mouth, Derek focused on the conversation. Moffat frowned deeply. Then he stood abruptly. Startled, Derek recoiled. Was Moffat going to shoot him then and there? Get him up, Moffat said to the man to Derek's right. Moffat stared hard at Derek and tucked his gun into the back of his waistband. A hand gripped Derek's arm, and he got to his feet. Those your people out there? Moffat asked. Killing more of my men? Of course it is, Derek shook his head. I doubt it. They have no idea I'm here. Moffat scowled, then motioned with his chin for the man whose hand was clamped around Derek's upper arm to lead Derek out of the room. Where are you taking me? Derek asked as he shuffled forward. He could slam into the guy leading him, but the shackles were a real liability. If he ended up on the ground, Moffat could easily shoot him. And even if he stayed upright, he wouldn't be able to run. Instead, he slowly made his way out of Moffat's office. You'll see soon enough, Moffat said from behind him. Another security man joined them. Perfect. Derek berated himself for not at least trying when it was just him and Moffat. If Moffat was going to shoot him anyway, why not take the chance of getting away? As they shuffled down a hallway, Derek could see that they were in a house, a very large house. Was this where Moffat had lived before? Or had he taken over someone else's house when society had collapsed? Didn't matter, but he wouldn't put it past the guy to take any advantage he could. They reached a grand foyer with soaring ceilings. The closed front door stood right in front of them. What was Moffat going to do? Derek braced himself for whatever was to come. Chapter 35 Matt. The governor's front door opened. Matt shrank back against the house he was hiding beside, which was across the street. Jessica and Cleo were right beside him. Jeff and Chris were hiding near another house a short distance away. Two security men were stationed on the wide front porch, but they stood behind thick columns, presumably to keep them out of range of snipers. A moment later, Derek came into view. Matt's eyes widened. It's Derek, Jessica whispered. With his eyes riveted to the scene unfolding in front of him, he nodded as he reached over and put his hand on Jessica's arm to let her know he heard her. Then, with a quick glance at her, he put a finger to his lips. She nodded her understanding. His gaze shot back to Derek. In the glow of the porch light, Matt saw that he wore handcuffs on his wrists and shackles on his ankles. Then a man appeared directly behind him, holding a gun to his head. Who was that? He was wearing a suit, not a security uniform. Trying to decipher what was happening, Matt squinted. Whoever's out there, the man holding the gun shouted, hear me now. 
I am the governor, and you will do as I say. Drop your weapons and come out with your hands high in the air, or I will shoot your friend. Matt's lips curled into a scowl, but quickly changed to a frown. With Jeff and Chris too far away to communicate with, Matt didn't know what he should do. How many security men were left? Would Moffat really shoot Derek? He had no doubt that Jeff and Chris weren't about to give up their weapons or reveal themselves. Jessica tapped him on the arm. He turned to her. She gave him a look, asking, What should we do? He shook his head and shrugged. She bit her lip, her eyebrows bunching. Come on now, Moffat shouted. You don't want your friend dead, do you? Don't come out, Derek yelled. He's gonna shoot me anyway. Matt's eyes widened as he stared at Derek. Shut up, Moffat said loudly enough for Matt to hear. We have to do something, Jessica whispered beside him. Cleo whined softly. That's when Matt caught movement off to the left of the governor's house, from the same direction Jeff and Chris had been hiding. Had to be one or both of them. Matt smiled, relieved that they had a plan. He just wished he knew what it was so that he could help. But since he couldn't, he was rendered a spectator. The governor's house was well lit. Matt realized it wouldn't take long for Jeff and Chris to be revealed. And with the two security officers stationed behind the columns, Jeff and Chris would be easy targets. I need to create a distraction. Stay here. Matt whispered to Jessica. Her eyes went wide. Where are you going? He just shook his head, his lips clamped shut. Then he tucked his gun into the back of his waistband and pulled his T-shirt over it. Next, he raised his hands in the air and stepped out from behind the house. He was still in shadow. No one had noticed him. I give up, Matt shouted. He heard a gasp come from Jessica. He prayed she would stay hidden. All eyes shot to Matt, including the two security officers, who were poking their heads around the columns, their pistols pointed at Matt. Feeling uncomfortably exposed, Matt stayed in place, desperately hoping they wouldn't open fire, because if they did, he was dead. Keeping his gaze steady on Moffat and Derek, Matt used his peripheral vision to track Jeff and Chris, which was when he saw a figure on the left that had to be Jeff, and another figure on the right that must be Chris. Looked like they'd split up, and Chris had gone around the back of the house. It was up to Matt to keep all eyes pointed forward. Turn around, one of the security men called out. Hating the idea of turning his back on these guys, Matt shouted, Let my friend go! Don't make me tell you again, the man said. Jaw clenched, Matt slowly turned his back. Now, the man said, lift your shirt. He should have left his gun with Jessica, because when he lifted his shirt, he would reveal that he was armed, that he hadn't followed their directions. Would they shoot him without giving him a chance to disarm? Stressed, but confident that Jeff and Chris would take advantage of the distraction, Matt ever so slowly lowered his hands and reached for his T-shirt. That's when all hell broke loose. Chapter 36 Derek What is Matt doing? Trying to get himself killed? Derek appreciated Matt trying to save him, but it was futile. The governor was out for blood. He didn't care whose. Derek's only hope was that Matt wasn't alone and that he was following a plan. Bracing himself for whatever was to come next, Derek tried to lean out of the doorway so he could better see what was happening. The governor was still well inside the house, which kept Derek inside as well. All he could see was Matt standing with his hands up and his back to them across the street, and the two security men hiding behind the wide porch columns. Eyes sweeping the area, Derek tried to catch any movement that would indicate Jeff or Chris or whoever had come was nearby. 
Then, despite his deep concern that the governor would get a shot off that would end his life, Derek smiled ever so slightly. His friends were good at this, and if they were out there, and he had to assume that they were, even he wouldn't be able to spot them. Lift your shirt, one of the security men shouted to Matt. Matt moved ridiculously slow, obviously trying to buy time. His hands reached the edge of his shirt. All eyes were glued to him. A gunshot sounded incredibly close, immediately followed by another. Both security men fell. Derek didn't hesitate. He slammed his head back, smashing it into the governor's face. Moffat cried out, his gun clattering to the floor. Derek spun around as best he could with the shackles on his ankles, then dropped into a crouch, his cuffed hands reaching for the gun. It was out of reach. Propelling himself awkwardly to the side, he grabbed the gun and swept it around the room. A security man bolted into the room, his eyes wide as he looked around. Derek didn't give the man a chance to evaluate, shooting him in the chest before his eyes had reached him. Two more security men entered the room, but before Derek had a chance to shoot, gunshots came from the doorway behind him, taking the security men out. With a quick glance, he smiled when he saw Jeff standing there with Chris watching his six. How many are there? Jeff asked. Not sure. You broke my nose, the governor cried out as blood leaked between the fingers he held to his face. Then Moffat's eyes darted to Jeff before opening wide. Hey, you're the other one, John Doe. Jeff chuckled. That's me. Don't shoot, a man cried out as he entered the room with his hands in the air. Both Jeff and Derek turned their attention to the man. It was the same man the governor had asked to look up Tony Webb in the database, the governor's aide. Jeff quickly searched him but didn't find any weapons. Sit there, Jeff told the man, who obeyed without comment. With a single nod at Derek, Jeff turned and, with gun leading, headed into the depths of the house. Matt and Jessica burst into the house moments later, with Cleo right beside them. You okay? Derek grinned. Thanks to you, yes. He got to his feet and faced his friend. Nice move earlier. Scared me half to death, Jessica said, as she ran her fingers through her hair. Important thing is, Matt said, it worked. The front door stood open, with Chris keeping watch on the porch. Is someone going to help me? Moffat asked from the floor. Derek rolled his eyes at the governor, then looked at his aide, who was scowling at the governor and shaking his head. Interesting. Jeff came back into the room. All clear, but we should get going. He looked at Moffat, whose white shirt was stained with blood. What do you want to do with him? With a nod at Jeff and Matt, he said, Get him to his feet, will you? He turned to Jessica. See if you can find keys for these things. He held up his cuffed wrists, then pointed at his ankles. Jeff and Matt each took one of Moffat's arms and yanked him to his feet. No need to be so rough, Moffat said, with a voice that said he knew he was no longer in charge. Jessica searched first one security man, and then another, coming up with the needed keys. She released Derek's restraints. Thanks. Derek rubbed his wrists, then turned to Moffat. He could so easily shoot him and end this, but he wasn't the kind of man to kill someone who was completely helpless. Instead, he faced the governor and said, I'm placing you under citizen's arrest for treason, for failing to keep your oath to protect and defend the Constitution. You have no right, Moffat growled. The aide stood. Actually, he does, and I'm a witness to what he claims. Moffat turned to the man with fury in his eyes. I never trusted you. This was an unexpected turn of events. Derek smiled as he yanked Moffat's arms behind his back and placed him in cuffs. We got company, Chris shouted as he came in from the porch and slammed the front door. Several cars just pulled up. Moffat laughed. That's the end of your motley crew. 
The aide went to a window and pulled back the curtain, then turned to Derek with a smile. It's okay. I can talk to them. The adrenaline that had been starting to recede came surging back. Who is it? The lieutenant governor and his security detail. The aide's smile grew. He's going to be pleased with Moffat's arrest. He's been against all of Moffat's decrees. Shut up, traitor, Moffat shouted. Jeff backhanded him. Pipe down. Moffat's shoulders sagged. Derek stared at the governor's aide, evaluating whether he was being truthful. His gut told him that he was. What's happening out there? The aide looked again. They're spreading out with their guns drawn. Crap. They'd obviously seen the bodies outside. The aide looked to Derek for direction. Derek and his team had their guns drawn and at the ready. Derek grimaced. We need to talk to someone in authority. Can you make that happen? The aide nodded. With Moffat between them, Jeff and Matt moved him into an adjoining room. Chris and Jessica followed. Derek moved to the side of the door. He nodded at the aide. The aide pulled the door open and with hands raised, stepped onto the porch. Don't shoot. It's me, Ed Parker, Governor Moffat's aide. What's going on in there? A voice called out. Is the governor all right? Everything's fine, but I need to speak with Lieutenant Governor Clark. Silence followed. Then, you may approach. Derek didn't like this. He wanted to hear what the aide told Clark. To the aide's credit, he didn't give away that Derek was standing nearby, instead facing front the whole time as he whispered, Trust me. Derek didn't see as he had any other choice. Chapter 37 Derek When the front door closed behind Ed, Derek felt his chest tighten with worry. What if Ed turned on them and brought the wrath of all the men outside down on them? There was a good chance they would all die, all five of them. The thought brought on a terrible sense of despair. It'll be okay, he told himself. Hard as it was, he had to have faith that it would all work out. The minutes ticked by, every one feeling like an eternity. Finally, the knob turned and the door swung open. Standing to the side of the front door, Derek lifted his gun and pointed it at the space where whomever entered would be in his crosshairs. Ed stepped through, closing the door behind him. He was alone. Somehow that made Derek feel better, because if he was going to turn on Derek and his friends, he would never have come back, right? Derek lowered his gun. Good news, Ed said with a broad smile. The new governor, Governor Clark, would like to meet you. Slowly nodding, Derek said, All right, if he comes inside, I'll talk to him. His security detail insists that at least one of them come with him. That was understandable, although Derek wasn't thrilled about it. Unarmed. Not sure if they'll go for that, but I'll check. I have no desire to shoot anyone. I just want to protect my people. Understood. Give me a minute. Derek nodded. Ed left. With hope filling his chest, Derek waited. Several minutes passed. Finally, the knob turned again. Derek lifted his gun. The door opened. Ed stepped over the threshold with a smile. They agreed. Rather astonished, Derek said, All right, let's do this. Ed stepped back and held the door open. A man who was clearly security stepped through first. He held his hands out to the sides as he eyed Derek with suspicion. By the look on his face, Derek knew he was doing this against his best judgment and just following the orders of his boss. Over there, Derek said, using his gun to motion where to go. Keep your hands where I can see them. With a scowl, the man did as he was told. Derek quickly patted him down, reassuring himself that the man was unarmed. That didn't mean he wasn't dangerous, but it was something. And it wasn't unreasonable for the new state governor to need protection. It said something that Governor Clark was willing to meet with Derek and his team under these circumstances. 
Keeping the security man within his view, Derek looked at Ed and gave a short nod. Ed smiled and turned to whomever was on the porch. Sir? A man in dress pants and a white shirt with a red tie walked into the room, a cautious smile on his face. Of average height, he wore glasses and was balding. Ed closed the front door. Governor Clark? Ed said. I'd like to introduce you to Joe Citizen. Clark stuck his hand out and took a step toward Derek. No offense, Derek said, but I need to make sure you're not armed. Clark chuckled. Of course. He raised his hands as Derek did a quick search. He was clean. Derek tucked his gun into the holster at his hip, then stuck out his own hand. Nice to meet you, sir. Clark shook his hand with vigor. I understand there's been some excitement this evening. He glanced at the bodies lying on the ground as he spoke. Softly chuckling, Derek said, you could say that. Ed tells me Moffat's still alive. I'd like to speak to him. Of course. Derek swept his hand toward the adjacent room where everyone else was waiting. Clark and his security man led the way. Ed followed, and Derek took up the rear. He wanted to keep everyone in sight. It's okay, Derek said to Jeff and the others. They looked extremely nervous, but they holstered their weapons. Nothing's okay, Moffat shouted. They cuffed me. His voice rose in clear indignation. Derek closely watched Governor Clark's reaction. Sorry to hear that, Clark said with an expression that said he wasn't sorry at all. But that's what happens when you betray our great constitution. Moffat's eyes went to slits as he tilted his head. What? You're going to allow this? Clark chuckled. Not only allow it, but endorse it. It's been a long time coming. You've done many, many despicable things. I'm just glad Joe Citizen here, he swept an arm toward Derek, stepped up and set things right. Clark smiled at Derek. Well, set this right. It's up to me now to put things back to how they should be. Fresh hope surged in Derek's chest. What do you have in mind? Governor Clark looked thoughtful. First, end this ridiculous gun confiscation, which goes against everything I believe. You said you supported it, Moffat nearly screamed. Clark chuckled. And if I'd told you otherwise, I'd be dead, wouldn't I? Moffat glared at Clark, which told Derek that Clark was right. What else? Derek asked. We have several warehouses filled with food and other supplies, he glanced at Moffat, that we were using as leverage to get people to give up their weapons. He shifted his gaze back to Derek. We'll make those supplies available to the neediest in our state, right away. He went quiet as his gaze went to the floor. Then he lifted his eyes to Derek. People have been suffering needlessly. I mean to rectify that. Thrilled that the right man would be running things, Derek felt himself relax as a sense of peace swept over him. That sounds good, Governor. Derek looked at his friends, who wore expressions reflecting the way he felt. It's getting late. We need to get back. Clark nodded and stepped forward with his hand outstretched. Derek took it. Thank you again, Clark said, for all you've done. The people of the state of California will only benefit from this change. Derek looked Clark right in the eye. We're counting on you, Governor, to make this right. A look of resolve settled over the governor. I understand. Derek released the governor's hand. What will happen to him? He chin lifted to Moffat. We'll give him a trial, Clark smiled. I still believe in due process, but I think we both know how it will go. Derek nodded. That was fair. He looked at his friends. They all gave small nods. Time to go. Best of luck to you. Governor Clark said to Derek, before sweeping his gaze over the others. He turned to his security man. Make sure they get out safely. The security man led the way, opening the front door and stepping onto the porch. 
Let them pass on orders of Governor Clark. Derek went out first, his gaze raking over the assembled group of armed men who kept their guns pointed at the ground. He looked behind him at his team and nodded. They walked out the door and down the walkway, turning when they reached the sidewalk. Ignoring the men who Derek knew were watching them closely, Derek picked up the pace. He was eager to be back home. When they reached the SUV, they all climbed in, including Cleo, which made it a little tight, but Derek didn't care. He was thrilled to be with his friends and on the way home. Once Chris pulled away from the curb, Derek finally felt himself beginning to truly relax. As they drove, they talked about the evening. Derek filled them in on what had happened before he was presented as a hostage on the porch, and they replayed their side. I like Clark, Derek said. I think he's going to do what's right. I do too, Matt said. Seems like a good guy, but I guess time will tell. Yeah. When they got back to the farm, it was late, but Emily was on guard and she opened the gate and let them through. By the time they parked the SUV and climbed out, everyone but the little kids had come outside. You're back, Amy said, as she ran to Chris and threw her arms around him. Emily embraced Jeff, and of course Matt and Jessica were together. Derek couldn't stop himself. He found his gaze searching out Paisley. She was staring at him, her expression guarded, but then it was as if a wall fell down, and she broke away from the group and walked toward him, her expression shy. She stopped in front of him and smiled at him. I'm so glad you're okay, Derek. I was worried sick. Knowing how much she'd worried about him warmed him to the core, and without allowing himself to talk himself out of it, he stepped forward and pulled her into his arms. To his pleased surprise, she sank against him, resting her head against his chest. After several long moments, she drew away and smiled at him, the promise of a possible future in her eyes. Feeling all kinds of optimistic, he smiled back. Tell us what happened, Derek, Dylan said, wrenching Derek's attention away from Paisley. She stood near him as he replayed the events of the evening. So this new governor, Emily said, you think he'll follow through? I do, Derek said and he meant it. This seemed to bring on an overall feeling of optimism among the group, which only added to Derek's positive feelings. After they'd talked themselves out, everyone said goodnight and headed off to the house or their trailers. Derek walked Paisley to her trailer and told her goodnight, then went to his home on wheels and stepped inside. As he dropped onto the small couch, he thought about how close he'd come to being killed and now, being at the farm, being home, he felt amazing. And knowing that his friends had come for him, had risked their very lives for him, was almost more than he could take in. Grateful for every single thing he had, he couldn't imagine ever taking his good fortune for granted. He leaned his head back and closed his eyes as he tried to imagine what the future would look like. But it was difficult with so many unknowns. Whatever the future held, he knew his friends had his back, and he had theirs. As long as that held true, they would be able to face whatever the world threw at them. Exhausted, he drifted off to sleep with a smile on his face. Epilogue. Four months later. Derek. I could use some fresh tomatoes. Sarah said with a smile, when Derek asked what he could do to help. Coming right up. Stepping onto the deck, Derek stopped for a moment to enjoy the warmth of the sun on his face. It was late afternoon on a September day, so really quite pleasant. Without air conditioning, he'd gotten used to the heat during the summer. As far as he was concerned, he'd rather deal with that than the upcoming winter, although it wouldn't be nearly as cold as it was back in Utah. He was grateful for that. He walked toward the garden, smiling when he saw Paisley working beside Jessica as they pulled weeds. It seemed like the weeds never stopped growing, and someone was working out there every day to keep them under control. It was worth it, though. 
The garden was producing extremely well, keeping them fully stocked on vegetables. And when they had a surplus, they took them to trade to a local farmer's market that had sprung up. Ever since Governor Clark had taken over the California state government, things had begun to improve. Derek was impressed with how well the man had kept his promises. First off, he'd immediately put Moffat on trial. Moffat had been found guilty and, without delay, had been executed. As well, the gun confiscation had ended, and the government was helping those most in need. Derek and his group were getting by fairly well on their own, so they hadn't collected anything from the government, preferring to be as self-sufficient as possible. They'd installed the solar panels they'd gathered and had enough electricity to keep the lights on, which was nice. Derek had heard that power was coming back on in places, mostly larger cities. Even better, law and order was being restored, giving everyone a small sense of security. Medical clinics had opened in several places, giving a reliable place to get antibiotics and other medical care. Wearing a smile, Derek walked over to Paisley. She stood and faced him with a smile of her own. He leaned down and kissed her, still in awe at how their relationship had progressed over the last few months. His life felt complete, and he could see a future, a good future, a positive future. With his arm around Paisley's shoulder, Derek turned to Jessica. How's it going? She stood and wiped the sweat from her brow. Not bad. I think we're about done out here. Does Sarah need help in the kitchen? Paisley asked. Probably. She sent me out for tomatoes. She smiled. Mmm, nothing like fresh tomatoes to make a meal better. I'm on watch in half an hour, Jessica said as she wiped her hands on her jeans. I'm going to grab a cold drink first. She smiled at them. See you two at dinner. Derek nodded, then turned to Paisley. Help me get those tomatoes? Of course. As they were carrying the tomatoes into the house, Serena, Paisley's two-year-old daughter, ran up to Derek and lifted her arms to be held. He handed the basket of tomatoes to Paisley and scooped Serena up, still surprised at how much he'd grown to love the child. Life was good, for all of them. They still had their challenges. They couldn't just run to the store or order things from Amazon when they ran out of something, but their basic needs were being met and they felt safe, which counted for more than Derek would have ever realized. Even more, he was surrounded by the people he loved, people that he considered his family, and that was the most important thing of all. This has been Insurrection, Pandemic Book Four, written by Christine Kersey, narrated by Andrew Tell, Copyright 2020 by Christine Kersey. Production copyright by Christine Kersey. Thanks for listening.